So I, I was talking about, I used to help my mom clean houses on the weekends mm-hmm. because that's what she did. Yeah. You know, uh, I would, we would, I would, I always remember, dude, we would go to the park in our neighborhood in Inglewood. We'd get to play and then we'd have to get a bag and go through the trash cans and collect all the cans and the plastics. To make it. But to make it, yeah. you know. Survive. Yeah. It was so embarrassing for me. I hated that shit. Yeah. I hated that shit. But, you know, I had no choice. I mean, but that I think kind of instilled work ethic in you. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Because good student, um, better student when you were doing the dean's list and when you mm-hmm. got out. Yeah. And then applying yourself to, again, the caliber. No, yeah, no. Well, the Marine Corps was instrumental in, in instilling some discipline. Mm-hmm. But then cause... again, you passed a California bar. Right? I did. <laughs> I did. Yeah. Or maybe that had something to do with it. That work ethic, helping your yeah, mom out. No, yeah, I can't let I can't let my family down. Whichever one you think, you know, which yeah, what's your good side? My best side. I think my this side. Right side. Tell me where you want me. Can I sit here? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Take care, guys. Bye. Right. Have a good night. Thanks, man. Let me take this stuff yeah, out of my pocket. Yeah, take your, uh, give me the stuff out of your pockets, babe, and I'm going to make sure your phone's on silent. Mm-hmm. There you go. All right. So you're used to this already, though, huh? Uh, a little bit. I mean, not, I, I'm mic'd up most of the time. Okay. They put a mic on put me. Put the mic on you. You got somebody yeah. touching you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we get on I can her. touch you if you want me. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't want to cheat on her today. Not today. <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever makes you more comfortable, huh? I mean, listen, do you? I'm used to people touching him all the time, so, hey. Some people get weirded out by how I approach a lot of my male friends. Yeah. Uh, really? Seriously? Yeah. By the way, when are you going to say on so he knows? Huh? It's already uh, recording. Okay. Yeah. So usually we'll turn it on that way people, it's not like, and go. Okay. But sometimes that kind of throws people off a little bit. Yeah, uh-huh. gotta catch them candid. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. just already kind of like recording. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, but I put a video on my Instagram. Like when uh-huh. I go to the barber shop, uh-huh. every barber, I don't care if you're mid haircut, I come up and I give you a little hug and a little smooch. <laughs> Everybody's used to it, except for the clients. Look. <laughs> just that room. And I'm like, hey, dad. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody in the barbershop is used to it, as, again, aside from the people who are getting their hair cut. I'm like, what's going on here? <laughs> people are yeah. weird these days. Sorry. Yeah. No, no. Uh, I, I'm very uh, touchy-feely with my guy friends, too. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> people, I don't know why it throws people off, though. Yeah, well, people are weird. It's from COVID, too. People don't get <laughs> the, like, the hugs or like... Yeah. Like, we got big boobs, so like, if I have someone, they're like... And I'm like, I can't, I just give me well, a damn hug, my God. You gotta do it like the wood. You gotta, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You tell me, well, this is how we down to LA. He's like, well, I'm from North Carolina. <laughs> it's one of my favorite movies. <laughs> so, uh, uh, it was very, uh, yeah, touchy feely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Growing up? Yeah. Well, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, what was the, the physical term? touch? Physical touch is my love language. Is that the one that you yeah. like to give love or receive love? Both. Both? Yeah. But I usually do acts of service. Acts it's of service? It's easier. Yeah. I think so, yeah. So do you yeah. like getting acts of service or giving? Giving. Giving? Yeah. 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 But yeah. The love, the, it's all different ways of communicating. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. I like physical touch and quality time. Yeah. Right. Quali- I don't, you know, quality time is also a pretty it's pretty important too. Yeah, it's, everyone has a different definition of what quality time, quality over quantity. Mm-hmm. Quantity also is important. Right? It is. <laughs> it. I mean, it depends because it has to be quality time. I don't want to be hanging out with you and you're on your phone the entire time. Mm-hmm. That's not quality. That's not quality. Yeah. No, that's just yeah. time. <laughs> right. Yeah. But yeah, if we can be, even if it's just like watching TV. Mm-hmm. Right, mm-hmm. and we're just both there, but you're not doing this. That mm-hmm. feels like you're distracted. Yeah, and if I'm next to you and I'm just like this, that's still quality, <laughs> right? <you know? laughs> to to some people, yeah. <laughs> you know that means I'm so comfortable 
that I can fall asleep right next to you. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? That's how you play it off. That's huh? a... <laughs> is that what he does? <laughs> That's how he does it. It's um, and I think for me, I didn't even know. I had a buddy. We went hiking, mm -hmm. and then he's like, "Oh, he's like your love language is gifts." Gifts. Like, oh yeah, yeah. There's that too. And he's just like every time we've gone out. He's just like, you end up getting something for your brother or your mom or your dad. Like, mm -hmm. I see something and it reminds me of, so I think mm -hmm. you might like it mm -hmm. or it reminds me of you. So, like, I pick yeah. up little, like, little things like that. And yeah. I was just like, oh, interesting. <laughs> so, that's one way of me giving love. Mm -hmm. um, but, like, receiving, no. Run your fingers through my hair. <laughs> <laughs> Snuggle up with, I mean, I get hot, though, so also get away from me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? But I was like, okay. I'm, I'm always cold. I'm really? all, it's funny because I'm always, I always feel cold, but my body's warm, mm. apparently. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how to. You give off heat? I do. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm convinced <laughs> my body temperature is like two to three degrees higher than most people's. Mine is actually lower. Really? When I usually measure my temperature, I'm usually like at 96, 97 degrees. Mm, it's usually 90, 98, right? Nine, it's supposed to be 98.6. Like the band? Mm -hmm. 98 <laughs> degrees. 98 degrees. Yeah, right. Nick Lachey? Oh, that's, yeah, there's a reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm <laughs> always hot. Okay. And I hate being hot. Those that's are the two things. That's why you're wearing a sweater? Well, right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm wearing a sweatshirt. I was telling my brother, um, I have uh, allergies like two days ago. Like mm. out of nowhere. My mom is convinced that it's uh, psychological things manifesting themselves in a physical uh, realm. Oh, right? wait, no. That's called um, pseudo... Uh, there's a term for that. Uh, not pseudoscience. Uh, it's, when, it's when you have... When your psyche... Like, when if you feel that you're getting sick, and then your body actually... Starts acting like as if you're sick. Hypochondriac. Uh, yeah. Hypochondriac. No, it's that's um, where you always think you're sick, even though you may not be, right? I keep inserting yeah. myself in this conversation. You're good. No, you're good. But you're recording. We are. Yeah, yeah that's good. You'll, we'll be able to pick some of the audio up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, I hate, no. It's, it's a really small room. Like there's there's yeah. an echo. No, yeah. but this is a, as a podcast listener. It's my. It's annoying when you hear. Oh, oh off right. camera. Yeah. Because it's like person in the back. If you're gonna talk, we would step up to the mic. Mm. Yeah, they always say that. Mm -hmm. It's true. Oh, no. You should have a, a, a mic in the back for the people in the back. We have. I mean, this is obviously our workspace, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. He, he works <laughs> that. Works here. Uh, my my office is over there. Okay. okay. Um, but there's times because the whole thing was he and I do a podcast. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes it's like, like he does your, a podcast your debrief do. after the week or something like that or something right or a podcast mm -hmm. together with me him and you mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. or like all of us okay but it we did shoot one with four people and you know it's like kind of like tight yeah um but you know for the time being we make we make do with what we have yeah that's good. um but it'd yeah. be good to you know like have more people and like different camera angles and yeah you know, like well something. we should um we're thinking about getting a bigger oh, office we should just come to our office Chet's this uh set up shop i'm willing and able to yeah. tell me what i gotta do to help set up you shop. gotta you gotta come over dude come yeah. like come literally come it's visit. across the street yeah it's literally across the street yeah, yeah. come visit we'll go I'll to drive lunch there. and then we'll yeah, you, he's yeah. Just, yeah he'll drive there i'll drive there <laughs> like <I did> today. <laughs> i'll walk <laughs> but it's um right now I'm, I'm doing a goal setting workshop right okay and all of a sudden like before i gotta get like a couple of things completed uh -huh. sneezing like all kinds of like allergies. So then my mom sends me like. A oh, you thing. have like seasonal allergies or something. I've never had allergies before. Like oh, I don't. I'm, yeah, I'm not. I'm not like I don't have allergies. Right, right, um, right, right. And I'm not sick, and I refuse to identify with being sick because mm -hmm, my mm -hmm. brother keeps on telling me, he's just like, "You better not get me sick." I'm like, "I'm not sick." I start thinking I'm sick. Maybe you have COVID. COVID dude. <laughs> I know. Imagine. Oh, but allergies come. They come. I didn't yeah. have them either until I was like 32. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, it yeah, comes for yeah. real. Yeah. You can develop allergies. Mm -hmm. And then um, the thing that my mom sent me, it's like all the different again, like psychological reasons why allergies may manifest themselves mm, right mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. she's like what do you think because there's a couple of different like um reasons what it could be and yeah. i was like no no yeah. no and she's yeah. like i'm not saying it is she's like i'm just saying like you need to figure out what it could be right, right, right. and i was just like well the only thing that i can think of is maybe the goals that i know i'm gonna have to do are daunting so mm. then like your body starts to like push and kind yeah, of like resist yeah. against it <laughs> and i was just like it's prepping itself yeah yeah for okay. the the hard road ahead 
exactly. or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I mean, you're doing good today. I, thank you, man. That's why I put on the sweater today. Usually, I'm wearing a gotcha. halter top. <laughs> trying, to, trying to make you get as comfortable as possible. I mean, if you're hot, by all means, take your shirt off. <laughs> Now, this ain't that type of podcast. It can be. Or is it? <laughs> exactly. It, <laughs> Episode one. Open mind. Exactly. We'll blow this podcast wide open. It's a new segment. Uh-huh. <laughs> this episode is brought to you by the law offices. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bam. <laughs> No, the world ain't ready for that. Yeah. It's, uh, whether they're ready or not. It's like the, it's like the Fuji song. They got to shock them. Ready or not, here we come. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was telling my brother yesterday. Um, yeah. <laughs> do you know my brother Mike? He goes by Mike now. His name is Miguel. Oh, really? That's yeah. my middle name. Oh, really? Miguel. Okay. Not Mike. Right. His, his... <laughs> Imagine <laughs> Stefan Mike Encarnacion. <laughs> and I did. I also didn't know that your last name was Encarnacion. And every time I see it on my phone now, I think of the Nacho Libre. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Encarnacion. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I told him. So he's my middle brother again. Okay. His name is Miguel, but he uh-huh. goes by Mike. Okay. And I told him we were going to do it today. And he's just like, oh, shit. He's like, che? And I was like, that's right. I completely forgot. Oh, Lisa that's you that. right. Yes. And then yes. I was just like, damn. I was like, I can't. Yeah, because I was a communist back then. <laughs> <laughs> Is that why? <laughs> I was. I wasn't it was <laughs> the belief system or you? No, I was. Uh, I, I, I read the Che Guevara biography. Okay. Or the and it wasn't an autobiography. It was a it was a biography. It's like a five hundred page book, mm-hmm. um, all about this gentleman's life and what he believed in and things of that nature. I believe. I mean, yeah, it's it's he's a revolutionary. Is Absolutely. what he was more than anything else. It's yeah. um yeah, and he 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 is very passionate about fighting for a cause, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So, um, his cause was f- liberty and freedom and independence from uh, dictatorship, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, he fought a war that wasn't even his war. Mm-hmm. It was other people's war. I mean, he's from Argentina. I was going to say he's Argentinian, and, yeah. And he goes to fight for Cuban freedom, mm-hmm. right? It kind of got messed up a little bit with Castro, mm-hmm. who had was more power hungry anything else but i mean that's my take on it but was, you know he was a doctor yep you know and to go from being you know he was also asthmatic yep yeah he, this guy he was also a womanizer mm-hmm. right but <laughs> he was a romantic per, a romantic guy mm-hmm. this guy was like a modern day sort of uh what do you call it uh a renaissance man mm-hmm. in the truest sense Right, because he 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 was. So those are things that I looked up to, and mm-hmm. I used to have a big ass Che Guevara shirt mm-hmm. and a big ass, and I had a big old beard. beard? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, she she knows. <clears throat> I, when she met me, I had I had just gotten out the Marine Corps, and you know you had to shave every day, every day. I'd have to shave no days. <laughs> you that. got a baby face, so yeah. you can get away with it. No, but we had to shave every day. And so when I got out, I said to myself, I am not going to shave at all for at least a year. And I didn't. And in that year, my beard grew all, beard. all the way down to the middle of my chest. Damn. Yeah. And my hair, too. Yeah. I, I, remember used, to have, hair. I used to have hair. You, yeah, you used to have yeah, long yeah. hair. Yeah, I used to have curly hair. Yeah. yeah. She 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 knows yeah. Mm-hmm. So I said because I had to cut my hair too. Mm-hmm. We always have to have a fade. Oh wow! You know, at, at, or you know, it has to be at zero at the bottom. You can get a low fade or a high fade. Yeah. But you always had to have a fresh haircut every week, and <clears throat> and shaved uh, a shaved shaved face. So I got I was tired of that, and so I committed myself. I'm not gonna shave or cut my hair for at least a year. And that's what I did. So yeah, when you met me, yeah, I was fully you were, bearded. You were full looking hippie, like, <laughs> looking like a Taliban. <laughs> yeah. So the um, have you seen Motorcycle Diaries? Uh, the one with the Mexican actor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what's his name? Gabriel Gael. Ga- yes, yeah, I did see it. Yeah. 
Oh, that was a long time ago. Long time ago. I saw yeah. it in theaters. Oh, yeah. Like yeah, ages yeah, yeah. ago. But mm -hmm. I knew about Chef from my grandpa. Oh, right, okay. and from my dad. Okay, um, and knowing that he was again uh, uh, Argentinian, mm -hmm. and he had asthma, and that's why he mm -hmm. got into medicine. Yeah, right, because yeah. of all. And he things. worked with the lepers. He worked, He did yeah. a lot of work with the leper, and mm -hmm. he was a he was one of the first ones to go and actually live amongst the lepers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And with his uh, his buddy, you know, they, that's what the movie is about. Him and his buddy trekking through South America, mm -hmm. and I think that's where it depicts what made him become the revolutionary seeing mm -hmm. all the the differences in like the social classes right, right, um right, right, and right. all the things that he eventually you know became like what he fought for exactly yeah the ideals and stuff like exactly that. the yeah. ideals that again it's been rumored that mm -hmm. uh fidel castro is the one who had him murdered yeah huh? yeah i could see because they did have a falling out Mm -hmm. And he was getting out. more popular. Yeah, and, and... Che wasn't about that. Mm -hmm. Right. So mm -hmm. che, che was really about spreading mm -hmm. the the true essence of what communism is supposed to be. But more than anything, is a freedom from oppression, from dictatorship. More than anything, that from imperialism. And then right? Fidel Castro was a dictator. Then, uh, yeah. So they did have a falling out, from what I remember reading, and yeah, that's why he he left Cuba. Mm -hmm. To go spread communism around the world. Yeah, like right. um, it was. I think it was Bolivia where he had. Yeah. I think where he was murdered. Yeah, right? he was murdered. And in then Bolivia. he. Was, they were contributing to some type of like faction out in like uh, North Africa or something like that. Yeah, that he, were... he ended up going to Cameroon also mm -hmm. to train them on revolution and mm -hmm. things of that nature. But yeah, I used. To, I learned about chair from Rage Against the Machine. <laughs> so at what age? Big, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> at what age did you start to get into uh, Che? Uh, when I was a teenager. Teenager? Yeah, yeah, when I was a teenager, and it's funny because it's it's one of the reasons. Man, I had so many reasons of why I joined the the, Mar the Marine Corps, especially. I like how you uh, segued into my question. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, learning how to fight. And th in, in my mind, thinking to myself, I'm going to learn the tactics of the U.S. military and of the most difficult, like, of what's supposed to be, like, the the serve, the branch that is the one who is in combat. Like, because these are the people that ultimately are uh, the imperialists, right? Mm -hmm. So in my mind, I was like, okay, let me join this. Let me learn. And... In the future, whenever I want to spread the revolution, I know already what I'm going to be up against. Right. Right? So, in my mind, I was thinking... I'm a mole. I'm a mole. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I may still be. Mm. <laughs> it's TBD. Right? Exactly. To be determined. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's kind of also what led me to want to wanna learn the laws of this country and what it is that I was supposedly defending. Mm -hmm. right and so yeah i am a, a little revolutionary at heart um my whole life i've always been uh against the system mm -hmm. whatever that system is um i don't i don't believe human beings are meant to be living in a system we live in a society but not under a system it's so unnatural mm -hmm. right organization Right, chaos is the the the, the state of being, mm -hmm. right? And finding organization is is normal, but being <clears throat> oppressed by a system is not. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what are the is that like when you were little and they told you to clean your room? You're like, no, fuck the system. It's funny. Or was uh, it? No, I was a good kid. Mm. I was. My mom could tell you, like, I've always been shy, so I always kept to myself. I was a good kid. I. I was very organized. Like I like to fold my own clothes mm. as a child. Still today, straight communist, dude. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. uh, a very organized life. No, what? If anything, it was just the experience that I had growing up in poverty, and seeing how it's kind of unfair in my mind at that time. Where it's like, you know, I have my parents just busting their ass every day for what? You know, to to get by barely, right? To mm -hmm. just put a roof over our head. And then ultimately, you know, that changed because I didn't realize what they were doing was actually saving money. And, you know, our economic 
situation changed moving back to our home our, our country mm -hmm. uh, costa rica but uh you know growing up in poverty uh you i mean i saw it because it's funny i so i i was we lived in inglewood in the 80s uh <laughs> back then in the 80s in inglewood that was a terrible place to be at you know uh, it was gang infested um it was i mean i it was normal for there to be uh drive-bys and like gang warfare in the alleys like i always heard gunshots in in the alley we lived in a, a one bedroom apartment uh in the middle of the ghetto uh you know there was cholos uh, like it was just like Take Terrible. a scene, like take a stereotypical scene from a movie, mm -hmm. and that's life. And that was it. Yeah, take know? like a '90s movie. Yeah, and you know the mm -hmm. hood in the '90s, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it's just like yeah. So like, they weren't that far off from no, how they life weren't. was. It really was like that. I mean, it was really, and it was just such a normal thing. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I I tell people like I saw my parents. I literally witnessed my parents getting held at gunpoint to their head as a child sitting in the backseat of the car. But like, you didn't turn into Batman. No, I didn't. Okay. Well, they didn't, they didn't get popped. No, true, true. <laughs> uh, but, like, I saw like I saw that happen. I saw one time that we were going to go pick up my mom uh, from uh, working as a cashier at a fast food place. And sh she got robbed. And there was a guy, a guy with a gun pointing a gun at her head. And she had to take the money out of the fucking cash register. Like, that shit, as a kid, you're like... I mean, it was jarring to live through that, but at the same time, it's like, oh, shit, I hope nothing bad happens. Like, it's kind of a normal, like, I see it. Like, it, there's nothing you can do. You're helpless, right? And it's not normal to grow, like, be raised in that sort of environment. So, yeah, I kind of, like, disliked this. But, so we were living in Inglewood, but... Uh, my my dad, my actual biological dad, he lived in Playa del Rey. Mm. So I went to school in Playa del Rey. And Playa del Rey is totally different than Inglewood. So hold on, let me ask. Yeah, yeah. Were you born here or were you born in Costa Rica? I was born in Costa Rica. Okay, and then came here at what age? At two. At two. At two. And then to live with your mom? To live with my mom. Yeah, because okay. my parents separated. Okay. So in, then in Costa Rica. In Costa Rica. Yeah. And then came left Costa Rica with your mom to live in Inglewood. Exactly. Yeah. And then would go to visit your pops in Playa del Rey. Yeah, because then he moved he moved to Cali. He's originally he's a he's what I call a New Yorican. A New Yorican. Yeah. Okay. So Puerto Rican from New York? From New York, yeah. Okay. He, he was from he's from the Bronx. Okay. Uh, he was born and raised from the Bronx. They met in New York, but Point being, like they they met, you know, they had me. I was conceived. Hold on, uh, dude. You you <laughs> you know when you have a map and these dots and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Brooklyn, New York. Mm -hmm. You're born in Costa Rica. Yeah. But your mom met him in New York. In New York. Yeah. Okay. Met him in New York. You're born in Costa Rica. Yeah. Then you come to LA with your mom. Right. And then he moves from Costa Rica or yeah, from New York. Yeah, they were living together. Okay. They tried to, you know, they yeah. got married and everything. Mm -hmm. and they tried to maintain a family. Right. My dad was also a Marine. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, he he served in Vietnam. Oh, wow. Um, and he he got out, but my dad got out with mental illnesses mm -hmm. and mental issues. Right. And so, uh, but it wasn't something that he was necessarily got from Vietnam. Something that he was born with. My my dad was born with paranoid schizophrenia. Oh, wow. But it does. It's not something that shows until you're in your mid twenties, which is when he got out of the service was when he was in his mid twenties. So did it add on to, Oh yeah, totally. totally. So it was like a snowball effect. Oh, totally. Okay. Yeah. So it, 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 and that's not something that, you know, paranoid schizophrenics when they're on their meds and they're good and they're taking their stuff, they're like a normal people. Mm -hmm. But, uh, paranoid schizophrenia, there's no, tr there's no cure. There's only treatment and the treatment, you can always have relapse. A relapse is when you have these episodes of little, little uh, hallucinating. You're hallucinating. You mm -hmm. you literally see and hear things that are not there. Right. Right. And no, 
no amount of medicine can take that away or minimize it. Mm -hmm. And so those are the things that started developing during their relationship. And she was like, yeah, this motherfucker's crazy. Did he and, know? Uh, that he, I'm like, was he I like mean, diagnosed and he, it was like, or was I'm it not just a paranoid schizophrenic? So I wouldn't know at what point do you have to accept that reality? Uh, right. If you can, even if you, if you can, because I've talked to my dad, I mean, and he's, when he hears things and sees things, it's there. Like he cannot distinguish reality mm -hmm. from his hallucinations. It is literally something that's present. He's literally seeing and hearing things that no other person can witness. But it wasn't like diagnosed. It's not like he knew while, you know, being he, with him. He mom. was diagnosed during the time that he was oh, with him. Oh, okay. Yeah, he eventually got diagnosed. Okay. Yeah. And so once my mom realized that, she was like, yeah, I don't think it's safe to raise me around him. Uh -huh. And their relationship, you know, couldn't work out. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so she left to find a better life here, not back in New York, because all my aunts had now, the majority of them have had moved over here, uh, seeking that American dream, mm -hmm. right? And so that's when she found, you know, they lived in Inglewood, which okay. is where, you know, immigrants coming to the U.S., well, where's the cheapest place to live? Probably in the ghetto, right? You can afford it. <laughs> did you guys have, did your mom have family in Inglewood? Uh, my aunts, like a okay. bunch of... So all uh, of them... They all migrated over here. Okay. Uh, back in the day, immigration was not an issue. Oh, bro, I was <laughs> smuggled into the U.S. inside of a pupusa. <laughs> you put a <laughs> curtido and the cheese on top of me, and that's how I got here. I mean, I was in a bucket of pollo campero. Water was uh, hiding in a capirucho. For real. No, it's funny because people ask me that. It's like, why did you join the Marines? Did you get papers because you were born in Costa Rica? I was like, it's funny you mentioned that. I was born as a dual citizen. My dad oh. is a citizen. My dad was, you know, a New Yorker. New York, yeah. You know, so I was born with dual citizens citizenship uh, so it made my coming and going easy easier yeah i never like yeah i have like immigrant issues and family but mm -hmm. i've never had to live the immigrant reality right because i have papers right so my but you reality, know what it's like i do know what it's like because everyone around me is, goes with does the has to deal with it right, right? okay yeah so, g moving on to Playa mm -hmm. del Rey, is it like summer? Oh, yeah. So, it's like it's a totally different America because that's where all the rich white people live. Is it like... And um, so, I went to a school with all the rich white kids, but my hood, I lived in the hood, you know? And so, I was always like an outcast because I never could uh, associate with them. So, your dad did what while you were growing up? So, my dad, because of his mental illness, was considered until this day 100% mentally disabled. Okay. So, my dad... His only real work experience was in the military. Okay. After that, he's been mentally disabled, 100% disabled. So, so does he do anything to like keep himself busy? Well, nowadays, he's been so disabled that he's now um, under a conservatorship mm. uh, with the county. Right. Right. So he's, there's a, it's called the Lanterman Pettis Act, a conservatorship. Um, he can't take care of himself. Mm -hmm. and I can't take care of him either. I just don't have... The resources oh, to do that. He, when I say resources, time. Time is a resource. It is. Right? It's one thing we can never get back. And you got to dedicate, especially oh, he with needs someone. a lot. He <laughs> needs a lot of help. He needs a lot of help. I mean, you know, he's he's 30 years older than I am, so he's 72. And, yeah, he's, he's under a conservatorship. Mm -hmm. He's a danger to himself and to others. So, yeah. So when you were going to school in Playa del Rey, was it like The Departed? How Mark Wahlberg tells you in order to Caprio, he's like, you have different accents, didn't you? He's just like, talk one way with the Southies and then with the other ones. Was it like that? It wasn't that, that drastic, but it was definitely a change of pace because, you know, I'm, I, I, I would like wish that I could go to my friends or like to the parties and the after school and things like that. And I never could because, you know, my parents didn't have the resources like that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and then I always had to get picked up and driven back to Inglewood, which was like a 30-minute drive. Everyone else is getting picked up by their parents and going home or walking home across the street and shit. And I never had that experience or that benefit to be able to hang out with my classmates. Do you have right? brothers or sisters? I have one sister. Younger or older? She's 10 years younger than I am. Oh, so when so you were I grew kid. up as a single child, essentially. Yeah. Right? And it's funny because 
the the reason we moved back to Costa Rica was what because age? my sister was born. Mm. So when I was ten, and my sister was born, that's when they're like, "Yeah, let's go back. We don't want to raise here her or me here anymore in so, Inglewood." So we moved back to Costa Rica. What is that like for a ten year old? You so, spoke Spanish, though, right? I well. I understood or were you a no sabo kid? I was a no sabo. Okay. And in, in the sense, like, I grew up around everyone speaking Spanish around me, but it was never uh, demanded that I had to speak Spanish to them. So I got away with that. Mm -hmm. So I could speak English to my mom and to my stepdad, but they would always speak in Spanish to me gotcha. and the rest of my family, right? Right. And La Abuelita. And I, everyone spoke Spanish. I always replied in English because mm -hmm. I was a no sabo. Yeah. But moving to Costa Rica, I had no choice. Yeah. Like, if I don't speak Spanish, I ain't going to make no friends. I'm going to fail in school. Like, I, even though I went to a private elementary or private bilingual school, it's like everyone speaks Spanish. Like, yeah. during recess, no one speaks English. Everyone's yeah. speaking Spanish. So I was like, fuck, okay, I got to learn how to speak Spanish. Yeah. And then how long did you live in Costa Rica? So I was there until I finished high school. Oh, damn. Yeah. I thought you only lived there for a little bit. No, from 10 to 18. So I did all my... Bachillerato? Bachillerato, yeah. El colegio. Well, we call it colegio. Yeah. Yeah. So I did... I graduated high school over there. Uh, life changed dramatically. Like, we went from living in poverty to being upper middle class in Costa okay. Rica. Because uh, I didn't realize, and that's what that was... Uh, like, the whole time living in Inglewood, part of the reason why we were so poor is because my parents were saving every single penny that they made to, for, for, to move back. That was, their, that was that my was mom plan. and my stepdad's, you know, my, I met my stepdad. My stepdad has, was in my life since he was, I was five. So he's Costa Rican. He's also Costa Rican, okay. which is a very unique thing. Like for my mom to find another Costa Rican, do you yeah. know the numbers, bro? No. So let me tell you the numbers. I mean, it's, it's better now, but back then it was, now in 2024, the Costa Rican population is about 4 million. In California? In Costa Rica. Oh. The total amount of Costa Ricans is about 4 million people. Wow. Nowadays. 20 years ago, huh. it was maybe half of that, right? So for my mom to find another Costa Rican outside of the country. Right. It's it's so rare, right. so unique, right? So yeah, they fell in love, and their whole plan was to just come, work, save, and go back and live the live the life over there. Right? And what is uh, what did your mom and your stepdad do in Costa Rica? Uh, once they got back, so yeah. they were able to buy apartments, mm. and they were able to buy a rotisserie, a wood fire rotisserie chicken restaurant. Ooh. Yeah, where my job during the summer. Kill was chickens? to no not get chickens. Oh. <laughs> was to load up the truck, the pickup truck with the firewood. Oh, okay. Because it was yeah you know, a firewood, firewood. Uh, oven. Mm -hmm. So uh, moving to Costa Rica, you know, they were able to uh, invest and have apartments, and we own we bought a home and uh, have that restaurant. My mom essentially retired once we got back. My mom retired. When she was my sister, she was like thirty-two. Oh damn! Yeah, so it, it life changed dramatically, right? I was able to actually go to. Uh, I went to one of the top three private schools in the country, in Costa Rica. Um, I was able to do what's called an international baccalaureate course. Like AP classes in Costa Rica. Were you going back and forth at all? Vacations or you were in Costa Rica? No, we were like in Costa Rica the whole time. Eight years straight. <clears throat> eight years straight, yeah. So that during those eight years, I was able to travel around up and down. Because like, that's what we would do. It's, just a, it's a small country, so mm -hmm. you can do that. But yeah, we traveled that whole country. Back, left, right, up and down. So it's a small place, right? But mm -hmm. there's a lot to do. Um, I was able to get enrolled in that like my classmate was the son of an ex-president of Costa Rica. That's how elite the school that I was in. Yeah, right. It's like those in uh, like the Central American countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like that. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's and again now it's a different situation because now like now we're, but I had been raised in Inglewood the whole time, so you know I'm 
ghetto. <laughs> I got that ghetto mentality, that thug mentality. And I, I didn't fit in with them either because I'm now dealing with the creme de la creme. Now you're the creme of the crop. Taking the ex-president's kids' lunch money. <laughs> right? <laughs> so it was a challenge as well because it's like, damn, I don't fucking fit in here either. Right? So, you know, I was always like, okay, I grew up here. We're going back to Costa Rica. I really have a choice in that. So where do I want to, like, my parents were always like, Look, you can you can graduate and then you can do anything you want here. Like, the world is your oyster, but in Costa Rica. Mm. I was like, but do you understand that I just came from the United States, like, the American dream? Yeah. Right? And so I was like, oh, that's cool. Like, I don't want to go to, like, because they, they were going to support me to go to a university in Costa Rica and, mm -hmm. like, develop my whole life there. I was like, well, but I've already had a glimpse of what America no, is. A little taste. Right, mm -hmm. right. And so I was like, but, and, um, um, and I saw my parents sacrifice, and I was like, well, all that sacrifice is for them and for my sister. Like, let me do my own shit, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And let me develop, like, I, I, I'm, thank you for all the help. I'm prepared. Thank you for, like, I'm prepared and I can confront life on my own. Mm -hmm. or let me figure it out. Because, like, my mom didn't graduate high school. My mom barely finished ninth grade. Uh, my grandma never went to school. You know, um, my stepdad, he... He did graduate high school, but he told me, he's like, dude, we, 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 we cheated our whole way through it, right? Like, we never learned anything. Right. Right? It's not something. They were, they were just here to work, and that's, like, what they were, the culture. Just work, work, work. Mm -hmm. Don't forget about school. Like, school's for the elite, mm -hmm. you know? And so it's what they taught me. was like, you need to, this, this is, like, the three things they always told me. You need to work, study, and save. That was the what In I grew order. up learning. Work, study, save. That was that was it. Like that's all. The, their their recipe for success was just that: work, study, and save. So they did want you to go to college. They did want me to go to college, <clears throat> but uh, that high school that I went to, that college preparatory, that was like another level of uh, academic rigor that I had never experienced. I was able to complete it, but I was burnt out. Mm -hmm. So, um, I was always going to go back to college or go to college and do something. I didn't know what yet. I didn't. I, I had you know, as a kid, I wanted to be a an a, an astronaut. <laughs> Who doesn't? All right. Well, I, more than that, I figured it out. I wanted to be. You need to be an aeronautical engineer. Mm -hmm. Like be, I want to be the first Costa Rican astronaut. <laughs> there is one. It's his name is Franklin Chang. Oh, there really? literally, there literally is one. Do they have a space program? They do. Oh shit! <laughs> Franklin Chang is a Costa Rican astronaut here in the United States. Well, he was. Oh, okay. He was the first Latin American. Well, I don't know about Latin America, but he was definitely the first Costa Rican to come to the United States and be a United States astronaut. Oh, sure. They changed the immigration laws in Costa Rica because he was born in born and raised in Costa Rica. But then he came here and then he got nationalized to, as a U.S. citizen. Back then, the laws were such that you were not, Costa Ricans did not have, allow you to have dual citizenship. One or the other. You got to renounce your you other had, one. So he had to renounce his Costa Rican citizenship in order to become a U.S. citizen. And because Costa Rica was so fucking proud of the fact that a Costa Rican from bumblefuck little piece yeah. country nowhere to become an astronaut in the United States, it was because of him that the laws were changed. Oh wow! To allow to allow me yeah. to have dual citizenship. Wow! Because my Costa Rican citizenship would have been denied, right? Right, or taken away from me. So because of him, is that I'm allowed to have dual citizenship. And what year was that? That was in the 80s. Oh, wow. Yeah, early 80s. You know? Franklin Chang. Franklin Chang Shout Diaz. Shout out to Franklin Chang. Franklin Chang Diaz. Diaz, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, his his uh, father is a Chinese immigrant to Costa Rica. Oh. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it's just all over the place. This is a melting pot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then at 18, once you finished high school, you were, you were wanting to do things on your own, right? Yes, yes. And I had... 
this revolutionary mindset and mm. you know i was raised in poverty i was like i need to do something different learn some shit fucking expand my my horizons mm -hmm. and i was like and i learned about the marine corps because of my dad my dad never wanted me to be in the marine corps yeah he he went he had his experience and and i always told myself too like if i'm going to join the military and i mean obviously i'm going to join the marine corps i'm not going to be less than that mm -hmm. right i want to challenge uh but then because of my dad i always made it a point that i'm never gonna come out like my dad mm. like I, I i i feared that like even though i joined during peacetime or when it was peacetime so i graduated high school in at the end of 2000 of uh, at the end of 2000 and i literally because in costa rica the school ends at the end of the year not, December, not, not in, in June. In, not in June, right? Like literally it ends at the end of the year. So I graduated in December, uh, January 16th. I was at MCRD San Diego, first day of boot camp. So you I bought my ticket. <laughs> so you graduated in Costa Rica and you're like, I'm going to the U.S. to be a Marine. Yep. Thank you. I didn't, I, I never went to a college counselor. I was the first one of that whole entire high school to not go straight to college. First one? The first one. Damn. <laughs> that whole college, every single person goes, is 100% straight to college. I fucked that up for them. Trendsetter, dude. <laughs> yeah, I, so I want to be different, right? Yeah. And so um, I, I never met with a college counselor because I was like, I'm not going to go straight to college. Like I'm You already go. knew. I already knew, you know? My, I would like my classmates would be like, dude, you're what? fucking crazy. You're gonna join the United States Marine? Get his like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> like, you're not like, what is wrong? Like, they're gonna put you up to fight. You're gonna be the first one up there to fight to go and die. I was like, it ain't like they're running around even a fucking war right now. Right now. <laughs> and then I joined, and then 9/11 happened. Oh my god. So what did your parents or what did your mom think about? Did did she know that you were gonna do that, or were you just? Well, yeah, yeah. No, I told my mom, and I they were cool. And they were like, "Well, well, I was like, well, y'all can't stop me. Yeah. I mean, there's, I mean, I love my mom and my right. stepdad and my sister, but there's nothing like y'all. This is it. Like, the, yeah. I'm, there's, I don't need y'all anymore. I don't want your support anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, plus my parents, they had a lot of fucking arguments. A lot. It wasn't a good relationship it was very toxic and i needed to get the hell out gotcha. and that was my escape that was like i need to get out i need to do my own shit i don't want your support like thank you keep all that shit to yourself you know and then uh, january 16th january 16th you're in boot camp. I, I was in boot camp yep and what's uh so like people if you people don't know anything about the military like so you have to take a test, ASVAB, ASVAB mm -hmm. right? That test kind of determines what job you can do. Um, uh, and you get to choose your job. Like people think like, oh, they just tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. No, you you get a choice. Between but these qualifications, cho you can choose between right, these things. Your choice yeah. is limited based on what you score, mm -hmm. right? Um, I had a very high score. I could have chosen whatever job i wanted to like when i the the recruiter was like oh see your score you can be an intelligence like we're gonna get working intel i was like yeah but i'm joining the marines you want to be like, like you know the, what the history of the marine corps is yeah you're we're the first to fight yeah that's you know? what you wanted that's, that's what, what i wanted i wanted that physical challenge i was like oh, dude i'm tired of using my head where before you uh made that decision let's say 16 17 were you already like, I'm going to go to the Marines, so I'm going to start working out. Nah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep in shape or like, I'll, I'll do it when I get there. I'll do it when I get there. Because okay. like, I stayed in shape by playing soccer. Because that's what you do there. Yeah. Costa Rica, that's just, that's the culture. Soccer, soccer. Right. So like, there's no track team because we all fucking play soccer. Okay. Right. Like, so you're already, <laughs> to an extent, fit. I would, yeah, I was pretty fit. You okay. Know? And I, I would go to the gym as a teenager and stuff like that. So I was, I was in shape. Um, it wasn't like doing boot camp wasn't like so challenging for me because i was pretty i was pretty had a pretty decent shape okay shape um uh, like running wasn't an issue uh the, the only issue was that i'm short mm -hmm. and so uh, i didn't necessarily calculate that because i wanted to be 
a machine gunner that machine guns are fucking heavy and uh <laughs> so you were a machine gunner i was you? a machine gunner fuck me going right yeah because <laughs> he said it yesterday he's like hey he's a fucking machine gunner and i was like it wasn't yeah I was like was he <laughs> yeah. oh. all right so, so there's then, two types of machine gunner uh -huh. so, so you're you like know. these <laughs> like, this one or this my one? Machine. <laughs> uh, my big machine. <laughs> exactly. So there's heavy machine guns and there's light machine guns. Heavy machine guns are those that can only be used on a tripod or on top of a, a vehicle. Right. Right. And the light machine guns are those that you can carry. Handheld. Right. That you can carry and shoot from like the hip, let's right. say, like Rambo. Mm -hmm. I was a heavy machine gunner. Right. So I was attached to a squad that we had humvees and we would mount the machine guns on top of the humvees or would dismount them and put them on a location you know with a tripod right right those so being a heavy machine gunner and being short uh is a fucking heavy ass job right because uh the machine gun system with the barrel and the receiver weighs 85 pounds with the tripod is 125 pounds and each box of ammo weighs 25 pounds so you know you have to carry a lot of weight and then if you're doing if you're humping hiking yeah with your pack the pack itself is another 85 pounds minimum right so i'm here carrying double my body weight uh to be able to keep up with dudes that are six feet and above so it's a challenge bro it was a, i wanted a physical challenge i got it damn yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So, so when they they're when they're like hey you could do anything you're oh, like oh yeah no i you're, I, you're I, like, I set that whole book yeah. aside of jobs and, and i was like, like look i just want to be a machine gunner and then so once you did like uh <laughs> basic uh-huh then you go to the school of infantry okay and then yeah. after that and then in the school i was so motivated to do this i got what's called the meritorious mass meritorious mass is it's like a little commendation little thing i was the best machine gunner in my school Ooh. yeah and, gold star yeah gold star yeah okay <laughs> literally and it's like it literally says like this is awarded to seven guns you know for his tireless ethic and work and like he's amazing blah 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 i was like if i'm gonna do this shit i'm gonna do this shit yeah i'm not gonna fuck around right, right. uh it helps to be a little bit smarter than your average joe uh, because, you know, to be a machine gunner is the lowest scoring test, the lowest score that you have to get, right? Like, if you want a job in the, in the military and you're dumb as rocks and you can pass it, you can be a machine gunner. Okay. <laughs> it's, right? Right? The least requirements as far as to be able to do that job is a machine gunner. Right. As far as, like, mental ability. And the, So I have a question, though, because you said that yeah. you were very, like anti let's say system uh -huh. or authority yeah what's that like being in in boot camp in just in that structure like well, I've never... okay boot camp was a the most difficult thing for me in boot camp was trying not to laugh that's okay <laughs> i think i think because these do these drill instructors like they used to love to pick on anyone for anything right uh -huh. And because I was in shape and I, I and I had a mental acuity, I didn't get I don't I wouldn't fuck up, uh -huh. right? And I would, could do my shit. And you I weren't Gomer have, Pyle. I wasn't fucking Gomer Pyle, right? But a lot of people around me were, and these they would get in your face and just say the most the funniest shit ever. Like they'll pick on you for anything, yeah, and everything. And so maintaining a straight face was the most difficult thing for me. But you and didn't I, have I, it, I, and then I would laugh. And they just send me. Trouble. To, I get in trouble. Yeah. But did you have a problem with like that authority or like telling what to do? No, because and stuff like I already, I, I you knew, already knew. In your I already head knew it was, it was part, part of the, the process. It's part of the process. So okay. I wasn't gonna fight it. Right. I knew that like the whole job of them is to build, to break you down, and to build you up as a marine. Mm -hmm. And the guys who can, who resisted that are the ones who had problems. Problems. Right. I knew that's part of the deal. Right. You know, I wasn't gonna resist that. Again, it was always like, what's the what's the system here? What do they got going on? Like, how do they brainwash people? Don't get me wrong, I got brainwashed. <clears throat> because when Iraq happened and when September 11 happened, 11 happened I was like, let's go. Right. Let's go fucking kill. Right. I don't know who, where, but let's... I, dude, I have a machine gun here. Right. We're trigger happy. It's... um, so I think there's certain... 
let's say maybe jobs or things where if you're okay with that, getting yelled at and people telling you what to do, mm -hmm. it's like it makes it a lot easier for you. Oh, it's, for sure. Yeah, or not yeah. as difficult. Like you think of like a, a chef, mm -hmm. right? Motherfucking yeah. chef is in your face and they're yelling at you and they're calling you a piece of shit. Right. And right, right. there's a lot of times where I used to think to myself and I'm like, I'd never be able to do that. I'd uh -huh. never be able to be cool with someone disrespecting me or like telling me what mm -hmm. to do or like mm -hmm. that structure. Mm -hmm. But it's like, but no, but what if I accepted that it was a part of the process or mm -hmm. what if I wanted to be a chef? It's mm -hmm. like, all right, maybe I'd, I'd be able to be okay with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, like you said, there's a purpose behind it, right? There is a purpose behind when it. When there's bombs and right. guns and everything right. going right. off, you have to be able yeah, to maintain be your able composure. To work in that chaos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then and that's something that you accepted that. right off the Oh, right jump. off the bat. Right off the bat. And then, right. look, look, you know, I joined before 9-11 happened. I joined in January of 2001. And then 9-11 happened. Nine months later. And when you're thinking I, that in those nine months, when I joined, was, I never thought I was going to be in a war. Right. I, I, I like, I don't know if you know this about Costa Rica. Costa Rica has no military, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. we, I come from a peaceful country that we don't even know what seeing soldiers looks like. Right. We got we abolished the military in the 1950s. Oh wow! Right. And so that was what my classmates were like, dude. Why are you like? Are you insane? Yeah. You're going to go join the military? We're in a country that doesn't even have one. Uh -huh. you know? But I knew all this, right? But I never expected that we were going to go to war. I never, like, that was never uh, a thought that ever crossed my mind. I mean, I'm an idiot. Because it's like, that's, I should have realized that, like, at any time, there can be, right? And that's not necessarily, I, that was just never a thought that crossed my mind. I swear, like, I never thought that I would actually ever... And then I think about it, it was like, well, if I, if I knew that there was war, would I still join to be in a combat field? Do you think you would? I think I would. Mm. I think I would. Because I know what it's like. I mean, the Marine Corps has such a history. Uh -huh. And especially, you know, infantry Marines. Like, there's a fame, that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, there's a saying, like, sometimes they say USMC, United States Marine Corps. It also stands for Uncle Sam's misguided children. Mm. You know, we're we're a little fucked up. You know, I mean, uh, and I've I, and I realized this. Yeah. Every single Marine that I've ever met, every any any military person that I've ever met, when it comes to like, dude, like, why did you join the Marine Corps? Well, I'm a little fucked up. It's like, like that's <laughs> that's to the home. That's where you go if you got a little. If you not, know, go to the Air Force. Yeah, lifeguard, like, lifeguard, like and I, it's it's a it's a real conversation because <laughs> people who do join the army and who do, like they know like they want they they don't want to join the Marine Corps because they know that the Marine Corps has this fucking his this crazy ass history, right? Right, and you gotta be a little off off to be willing to put yourself in that situation because uh, yeah, there's a lot of hazy. Oh yeah. Oh, tons of hazing. Tons of hazing, right? There's a his there's a tradition, there's a history that we have to preserve for future Marines. Mm -hmm. Right? The Marine Corps has this history of like we're the first to fight mm -hmm. and we will fight to death and we never leave a man behind. Mm -hmm. And it's it's that that warrior ethic, yeah. right? Ethos. I've and seen the commercials. It's living and breathing. Oh, right? even those commercials, it's like <laughs> 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 so it's like, it makes it look again like the everything that it stands for just like you said mm -hmm. like it's a if you want to be a fucking badass yeah. like if you're going to be in the armed forces well that's my that was my train of thought like yeah. okay i'm going to join the fucking air force <laughs> that does that does not, i'm not no <laughs> just kidding i no no, yeah. no i'm not you know but <laughs> i was a crosswalk guard that's a about as high as it goes for me with him so like so that. i decided to do this crazy ass thing and, and you hold on. You feel like in those nine months, from mm -hmm. January to nine eleven, there was a, a frame of mind that switched in you, and you're like more gun ho about like, let's go out and do it. Well, it was funny because you know during that that ninth month period, you're training, but you're like, what is all this for? You know, like, uh -huh. okay, we got to go pretend that there's fucking enemy out there. Then nine eleven happened, and that changed everything the training because the training at that point after that was like this is real shit now like we are gonna that's the speech that we were given we are gonna be we are gonna go somewhere we don't know when we don't know where 
But this battalion, because I was stationed at 29 Palms in the middle of the desert. Oh, okay. Like, if there's a fight in in an Arabic country and there's, there's a fight in the Middle East, we're the only Marine Corps battalion that's trained in the desert environment. So we are definitely going to go. Do you feel like there was things either evident or subliminal that they were doing to, like you said, brainwash? Or was it, is this like, you're here, you're training because this is what we do? Or was it like, we're sneaking in some like little like slick shit to kind of, like you, you know, said, like, like, brainwash? Like, that wouldn't come, that would, if there was some brainwashing and everything, it would come from the battalion commander. It would come from the very high, the top, top brass. Because they're the ones who orchestrated it all, right? Mm -hmm. They're the ones who are in charge of, like, setting things in motion, right? As as a grunt, as an enlisted personnel, someone straight out of high school who joined the Marine Corps, like, we're disposable, right? right? So... I know that. Mm -hmm. Like, my friends know that, I hope. We all knew that, that we're disposable. So, like, when it came to, like, having, like, fighting for for freedom or fighting for... I don't think any of us there were there. That is my opinion. But I don't think any of us went to Iraq thinking that we're going to free the people of Iraq. Thinking that we're going to spread you think was the mindset? democracy. So what do you think was the mindset? The, democracy, the mindset was like, we're going to go kill some fucking hajis mm -hmm. is what we're going to go do. But not for a purpose. Not for any fucking purpose other than just to go. Because they attacked us. Because they attacked us. Right? Okay. But more than that, I mean, that's one. that was one sentiment for sure. Mm -hmm. A lot of people felt like that, right? I, the, the majority of us, my squad, my, like my close friends, we were just there to keep each other alive. Right. I mean, you don't have a choice. Like, this is a lawful order. You want to get, maintain your benefits as a veteran. You don't want to fucking go to jail for deserting. You don't want to be... You can, like, in combat, in a war, if you choose to not fight, you can court be court-martialed. You can be sentenced to death for cowardice. Still? Cowardice is a crime in combat. No bitches. No bitches. <laughs> Basically. Yeah, no, it, it literally is, right? And so... You know, we're the majority of my friends. Like, none of us, we were about, like, politics. That was never a, a thing. Right. Uh, there's, an, uh, there's an assumption, but right? Like, there's, there's an assumption that everyone who joins the military is a Republican and is a gun nut. And don't get me wrong, that assumption is mostly correct for, there's, you know, there's some truth to it. There's some truth to it. Right. We, I was with some good old boys. Uh -huh. right? Some good oh, old yeah. boys. Right? Like, from they love mm -hmm. they love their guns mm -hmm. they love that shit don't get me wrong i never shot a gun in my life until i joined the marine corps and then shooting a machine gun a machine gun <laughs> that changes your life were there you, is so much power behind that were you like um mclovin when they're in the parking lot he's <laughs> <laughs> <was> like, oh! <laughs> <was> like tight <laughs> was that you no for real um Dude, it's because there's nothing in this world like like I like I I went through a lot of shit because of that experience, but there I, there's nothing that I regret from it, right? And having those experiences and using them as those weapons and being in those environments and fearing for your life and like the preparing you for me. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, She's like, like I'm his hockey now. <laughs> It's funny because I still, I have a group chat with all my friends from 20 years ago. And like, I'm realizing like, damn, dude, these are trauma bonds. Yeah. That was not a thing that existed back no, then. No, but We're, you can associate it now and you understand oh, yeah, what it is. Oh yeah, now as an adult, like, because then I, I think about it too, I was like, dude, I was an 18 year old. Like, <laughs> child, fucking young, dumb and full of cum, right? Like, literally. Even though I could have been smarter than the rest, I was still just as dumb as them. Because I did a lot of dumb shit. Yeah. A lot of dumb shit. I shouldn't be alive how because long, of the dumb shit that we did. How long after you enlisted did you deploy? Uh, so I joined in 2001, and we were in Iraq in 2004. So oh, three, so you, had our, you were in there for three years. Three years I was three years in, yeah. So when the invasion of Iraq started, we were stationed in Okinawa, Japan. Hmm. 
And we were only supposed to be in Japan for eight months, but then the war started, and then we got stuck there for a year and a half. Right. So during that whole year and a half, we saw everyone else go to Iraq except us. And then like were you guys itching to go? You guys oh, are... dude, yes, we were. You're like, I'm tired of fucking sushi. For real. It's like, what the fuck are we doing here? Like, this is our war. Uh-huh. Like, that's just how you guys, the how frame we of felt. mind. Like, the frame of mind was that. Was that. Like, we trained in the desert. Yeah. Like, like this, this is, like, be, they're uh... taking away our glory. So, all you guys were excited to go? All of us. Okay. All of us. And then you guys, what, is it a phone call you guys get? Is it no, a so, like, the, 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 the word came down finally. It's like, okay, you guys, <laughs> we're going to, we're going to be sent back home to 29 Palms. We're going to be there for two months to gear up to deploy to Iraq. So... That's when the word finally came. It's like, okay, now we have our mission. Now we have our marching orders, right? What's your mission? Well, we didn't fucking know. (laughs) (laughs) You're like, it's to leave. (laughs) So the crazy thing about this whole war in Iraq was that we were training for a conventional war. In other words, we were training to fight against an army. But by the time we got there, you know, the Iraqis gave up. They... (laughs) They gave up like almost immediately. Uh-huh. So when we got there, finally, it wasn't to fight against an army. It was to fight against guerrilla warfare, mm-hmm. right? Against terrorists. Yeah. So the way that we trained was not for that type of war. So we, it was a whole new way of dealing, of doing things, doing business, right? Right. And so ultimately when we got there, our job, I call it, we were the IHP. We were like the CHP. Uh-huh. We were the Iraqi Highway Patrol. Our job was to maintain you, a 60 mile stretch of road free from IEDs. Do you remember what it felt like? Let's say the flight over there. I wouldn't. I don't. Wouldn't say I was nervous in any way. Excited. I was excited. I was. I was with my friends. You know, I was with my squad. We would pump each other up. You know, um, we landed in Kuwait was south the south of iraq and then we had to drive through iraq to get to our our base that was three days of driving through iraq that was scary that was because like literally as soon as you cross the border you're in a combat zone like literally that's when yeah. and and we had <laughs> i'll never forget it we had a finite amount of ammunition we were not getting resupplied until we got to our base. So they were like, if you guys get into a firefight, conserve your ammo. Maybe shoot. Count. Have discretion. Don't just blow your load. Because you're not getting resupplied. You're fucked. So we were like, what the Again. fuck type of shit is this? You're sending us to combat without any fucking bullets? See, me, I'm... <laughs> Sergeant, man. <laughs> you guys can't drop us off any closer? <laughs> like, the fuck? You told uh, me, like, three days? Mm-hmm. That has to be a few thousand miles. Not a thousand. It's, it's, it's a slow, because it's the whole battalion. Okay. Right? It's the whole battalion. Either way. It's, it's not like, oh, we're dropping you off in L.A. And you guys got to go to, like... Yeah, no, no. The IE, it's just like, we're dropping you off in LA and you guys mm-hmm. got to go to, I don't know, Oregon. Mm-hmm. And you guys are just, is it, because again, you're Iraqi Highway Patrol, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But that so we're, whole thing. Like, literally, like you cross the border into Iraq and you see the devastation of the bombs and everything that's already happened before you. Like, Bro, like you're living in a regular fucking environment here, and then you go to a war zone, and then and then you see the people who live there, and you know it's just it's it's a very shocking experience. I'm not gonna lie, like it's a very unique experience. Um, I never i I have trouble with like being in that position, just because of all the shit that I read in history, like imperialism and this. I was like. Fuck, I'm an imperialist. Yeah. Like, fuck, like, I hate what I'm doing. But if I want to get out and go to college, then I got to do this shit. So there was a, uh, I would imagine, a sense of contradicting feelings. Because mm-hmm. you want to go out there, 
I, that's I what you keep my kid. I want to keep my friends alive. You want to keep right? your friends alive. Mm-hmm. That's what you signed up for. Mm-hmm. You've been waiting for it. But then when you get there, it's just kind of like, fuck. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but like, I mean, there's just no way. Um, and then it's like, okay, then we, I don't know if we managed to. Yeah, we had some bombs explode along the way. You know, you hear your first bomb explode. It's far. Like, yeah. That's not that bad. I can I can survive this. So the, the and then the first thing when you guys got to the base unscathed, everything was good. Yeah, yeah. And then you guys get there, and then you guys have your like. Well, then it? they a, tell us what camp? the mission is. A station, right? It's our operating base. Okay, our yeah, base. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, our base. Um. So then, our mission. They finally tell us like what the mission is. The mission is to keep this stretch of highway open so that the Iraqi provisional government can actually function. Like, you know, the terrorists were trying to shut shit down, right? To make it impossible for the government, for, for the provisional government to actually <laughs> take over the power and, you know, have a fucking democracy, right? Right, right, right. And so our job was to ensure that this stretch of highway was a main artery of commerce. And you need commerce for, you know, to have a country, mm-hmm. right? So... Um, is it an actual was, highway? It's an actual highway. Or it's, is it like... It's, it's a one-way highway. A one, two, two lane two lane highway. But it's right? like on a... Like asphalt? It's paved. Dirt. Yeah, it's paved. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it was along the Euphrates River. I was about to say the Euphrates? Yeah. Like, listen, <laughs> like jokingly. I was like going to be like, it's along the Euphrates? biblical shit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, I'm not a religious person, uh, but I know enough that, you know, Iraq was mentioned several, the uh-huh. Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Uh, yeah, I was going to say the, yeah. <laughs> that was, that was going to be the next them. one. We crossed them. We crossed them. Through fucking, the Nile? Yeah. Like, well, like, like, I think uh, I saw Moses. You're like, he was in a little... Uh, <laughs> but it was like, to be in the cradle of civilization... But as a fucking soldier, <laughs> like it was so weird. Yeah. So weird. Such a weird experience. So the mission is keep this highway going so yeah. that they but, can continue but, to do but business. But beyond that, like, so Iraq is interesting in, in the sense of like, you know, water is the source of life, right? Mm-hmm. You're in the desert in Iraq. There is only life along the rivers. Right. Right. So societies, countries, states, everything is along the river. So the road is also along the river, right? So there's cities and towns and, you know, little villages. So our job was to patrol those and go into these villages to have a presence, to be like, hey, we're here. Don't fuck around. Uh Right. And so when we would go there, yeah, we get shot at. Oh, shit. Yeah. We try to shoot. We don't know who's shooting because these people are, obviously, they're shooting with weapons that have no, there's no competition with what we got. Right. You know? <clears throat> they have old ass fucking AK 47s. There's no accuracy in those weapons. Yeah. So we get shot at. Um, but after, I mean, I grew up in the hood. Right, so like hearing gunshots and shells, that ain't shit. Yeah, 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 you know, like I need to see the barrel pointing right at me for me to like, okay, I'll die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, if if otherwise there's people just popping off, I'm like that, it ain't nothing ever gonna hit me. Okay. Plus, I'm wearing a flag jacket, or I'm wearing my helmet, and I'm in an armored fucking vehicle. So I we were in the, I wasn't personally like terrified of getting shot at. Right, it's an acknowledgement. Uh, it's like oh, there's something going on over there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um. But the scary thing was the fucking bombs. Yeah, because those you can't, those go off and there ain't no warning. There ain't no, yeah. How many tours did you do? I did one. I survived one. Okay. Half and, of it. and then, so how long were you on patrol and doing what you did? Yeah. Um, until, let's say, a situation arose where it's just like, oh, this is a little bit oh, more, more serious. So, uh, the, there was, there was only one time, the, the the time that I was there, where I literally feared for my life. Like, I've never felt fear like that. I felt like I was going to die. Like, I, f- I literally felt like if we go any further into this area, we are... The one thing that I never wanted to happen to me was to have my body dragged through the streets, which is what they were doing. If they captured a, sh- a soldier or a military personnel, 
they would literally drag your body through the streets and like there's they'd film that shit right to then that shit was happening and they would put it on cnn and Shit like that, like uh, military soldiers getting their fucking bodies dragged through, and then they'd be fucking behead you and shit. Like, um, yeah, uh, Achilles and Hector. Mm -hmm. that, that, I mean, well, I mean, in those times, it was a, so you wouldn't be able to have like a proper burial or something like that. Right, right. Yeah, that was the one thing that I always like. My obviously, my mom was mortified that I was there. Right. Mm. So that was the one thing I promised to her, without her knowing, that I wasn't gonna put myself in a situation where my body was dragged through the streets. Right. Which is a pretty crazy thing to think of as a fucking 20 year old. <laughs> yeah, man, right? I bet. <laughs> it's like on my list of do's right? and don'ts. Right. <laughs> Make sure you don't get in a situation and that could be a possibility. Yeah. So when we were finally in a situation where I saw that that was, we were in a situation where it was a one, a one way road surrounded by houses. There's no way to turn. And as soon as we got into this village, I started seeing uh, people with uh, rocket grenade launchers running on the rooftops, getting in position. I was like, dude, we, we're fucked. What do you do in that situation? Well, should I? <laughs> no, <laughs> because we're sitting ducks. When we got to that area, they had told us, look, you're going to go to an area that has it, no one has gone to for about a year. Uh, go check out the hostility see what the environment's like see if we need to i was like and we were all like okay cool cool but uh do we have air support uh no so like if we get in if we get fucked up or if we get in trouble or if we get contact who's they're like no y'all are there just to see what the sentiment like, yeah but what's gonna happen when we get fucked up like make it out make survive <laughs> right i was like oh my god all mm. right so we go and then yeah there's hostility and they have i see the fucking guys coming out with their rocket grenade launchers we're in humvees we're sitting ducks like we don't have anti-missile defense systems right right we have a machine gunner and fucking right and, and, and me right yeah i was a driver oh okay in that situation i was the one i was leading the whole squad right. oh, i got that right uh, yeah continue and so i was <clears> like <throat> I stopped immediately. I pressed the brakes. I was like, I'm not fucking going any further. Like, they're like, don't bitch out. Like, do you see what's happening here? Like, look at these motherfuckers. Like, we're about to get fucked up. And we ain't got no air support. Uh, my heart was pounding. I was yeah. like, dude, I fuck this shit. We, we backed out. Okay. And we survived that oh. day. <laughs> Jesus. And we reported back. Yeah, there's hostiles in the area. <laughs> I can see it from here. <laughs> yeah, can we bring some fucking tank division to you know? And then how did you get out of the army? Well, uh, so Marine Corps. Marine Corps. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Armed forces. <laughs> um, so uh, ultimately, what ended up happening is I was I survived a landmine blast uh, in one of our patrols. We had dropped off a group of snipers. Um, snipers were attached to our platoon, so our mission was to drop off the snipers so they can do their sneaky shit, and we have to maintain uh, contact with them, like visual and radio, in case they get fucked up. We're their nine one one, right? So we had dropped them off, and we were driving up to our observation post, which is a little hill, um, maybe like a mile or two from where we had dropped them off. Uh, it was going up that hill where the enemy, who knows who the fuck it was, had uh, buried some anti-tank landmines, you know, in the sand. And so my vehicle went right on top of a landmine. And that What kind of vehicle were you in? In a Humvee. In a Humvee? In a regular Humvee. Um, so it was the back tire that went over it. I'm, dri I'm the driver, and it's nighttime. And I'm using night vision goggles because we're trying to be sneaky and uh -huh. not be seen. But I don't know if you've ever heard a fucking V12 or V8 engine in the middle of a fucking desert. You hear that shit from fucking five miles away. <laughs> <laughs> ain't, ain't no, there's, there's, there's no stealth. There's no stealth when you're driving a Humvee in the middle of a desert. <clears throat> mm -hmm. You know, especially in an area that's unpopulated. There ain't no city yeah. out there. There's no, it's yeah. not like, you know. Nothing to throw it on. There's nothing. It's like, is know? that a duck farting? So. Like, no. <laughs> it's a Humvee. 
exactly. So um, it was something that was bound to happen. Like it would have been me. It would have been the vehicle behind me. It would have been someone was gonna run over this fucking landmine. It was me, mm -hmm. and so it was the back tire that went over it of the Humvee that was that propelled me forward. And we had just installed bulletproof windows because we we were we were rocking fucking regular windshields. So if we would have get a shot, it would have it would have been right through the windshield. We right. had just installed them. And like thinking that that was going to save our lives or help to save our lives. But the problem with bulletproof windows is that you don't go through them. You slam into them. Right. Right. So the explosion happened behind me. It pushed me forward and it smashed my entire face and helmet into the windshield. And so my whole entire face was fractured. Like I had multiple facial fractures. My jaw was split in three. My whole entire nose was crumbled. My cheeks were were broken. Uh, all my teeth were knocked loose. I had a fractured vertebrae. My my forehead was cracked in half. Uh, I was fucked up. <laughs> were you conscious? I was no. 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 You, so like, explosions. Do you remember? If you've ever been in an explosion, let me tell I you how, how it goes down. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> uh, you can't. You don't hear it and you don't see it. It happens instantly. Right. And like sound and all that stuff and light travels fast. Mm -hmm. So all I know is that I was driving and then from driving to touching my face, uh, looking up at the sky and hearing chaos around me, hearing everyone screaming and yelling. And, <laughs> and I'm very calm and serene. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like, why? Like, why did y'all throw water at me? Like, did I fall asleep? And it wasn't water. Right. It's my face is gushing blood. I, I wasn't. I never felt any pain. Your body goes mm. through trauma. Yeah. It instantly wants to shut down and preserve you. Preserve your mind more than anything else. So I can talk about this easily because I never experienced the pain associated with it. Like, it was never something painful. The, the pain was the surviving. And having survivor's guilt because uh, there was a staff sergeant sitting right behind me in the vehicle. And in the, in, in the Humvee, the wheel well of the back tire, the, the back seat is literally right on top of the back tire. And it was the back tire that went over the landmine. Uh, that pulverized his body. He, inst he died instantly. Like immediately. Uh, and so he never felt any pain. Which is good, right? Um, but uh, I I survived that, knowing or thinking that I knew that someone died. I didn't know who or when. I I had to find that out on my own at the hospital. Uh, so when you yeah, so you don't hear an explosion, you don't see it. Was it a firefight that ensued after that? Or uh, from my recollection, I do remember that we my squad was ambushed um, with. A firefight but i all i remember again is touching my face and then i knew that's like something major happened uh i was i was at peace which was like the crazy thing about it all i was calm i felt like my time was over i didn't feel like i was dying in any way um i probably was and i was which is why i had to have a tracheotomy uh, on the field. They did it there? They did it right there. The doc, who we always travel with uh, medic? A, a medic. We so call him a 91 doc, doc. It's a Navy corpsman. Oh, okay. Because the Marine Corps, just so you know, is part of the Navy. It's a department of the Navy. So we don't have our own medics. We have okay. Navy, Navy corpsmen. Yeah. So there's a corpsman attached to us. Anyways, that corpsman saved my life because everything was swelling up. So, you so I was choking on my own blood, blood and everything. And it was all swelling up. Um, so I had a tracheotomy right there in the field. Uh, I don't remember getting it or feeling any pain. Right. Or, ah, dude, I'm, I'm not even there anymore. I do remember hearing a helicopter thinking to myself, okay, I'm probably going to get medevaced and uh, I guess my time is done. I'm heading home. Um, I do remember like seeing like lights like this, you know, like being under uh, no. like in, in the hospital. No, operating uh, room? But I was... I was put into an induced coma because the brain swelling, Ooh, okay. right? The injury. 
Uh, I was put in, I was in an induced coma for two weeks, um, and then I finally wake up in Maryland at the they call it Walter Reed now. Uh huh. But uh, yeah, I wake up in a hospital. What was the first thought that went through your mind when you woke up? Uh, I woke up with my family around me. Like I said, I knew that I was fucked up. Uh, I didn't know the, to what extent because when I woke up, I, all, all my teeth were wired shut. My whole mouth was wired shut because mm-hmm. everything was knocked loose. Um, I was blind because of the swelling. I couldn't open my eyes and I had a tracheotomy, so I couldn't speak. Mm. And so I wake up, uh, I, I couldn't even, I could hear my mom and my sister. And so I was happy to know that I, they were there next to me. Um, I had to write on paper to communicate. Was that, I would have freaked the fuck out. Like waking up and again, you don't really know what happened I to needed you. to pee is what <laughs> I needed to do when I woke up. And I had a catheter. Uh-huh. I had never had a catheter in my dick. Mm-hmm. And I woke up with that shit, feeling it. I was like, what? Oh, fuck, this shit is painful. And you had to pee so bad. And I being conscious and having to pee through that thing is terrible. It's a terrible experience. Uh, but I, you know, I, I didn't know if I had limbs. I didn't know if I had my legs. I didn't have, I had no, oh, I completely uh, forgot about that. I was that. blind, dude. Like I had no you just knew way my... of knowing anything of what happened to me. You just know that you're, I'm just a awake, conscious being. It was finally, uh, that I, the doctors come around. And I wrote notes, like, am I okay? Like, do I have, like, I had to, like, do I write? How could you see what they were, sp- oh, they would talk to you. No, they would t- I could hear. <laughs> yeah, you're yeah. writing in the writing. <laughs> yeah. They're like, I can't see that. <laughs> <laughs> but I had to communicate like that, and I was able to, like, yeah, I was, I was whole. And they told you, like, hey, you were in a accident. Well, they don't know. Oh, they don't know. They don't know. They don't know what the fuck happened to me. All they can tell you is you're going to be okay. That I'm stable. I woke up in the ICU and I'm stable and that there's a plan of treatment. And the plan of treatment is to put my face together. Okay. Uh, They didn't know. They focused so much on my face uh, that uh, so my whole hospitalization was three months. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, They they did. a surgery with eight specialists to reconstruct my face. And so that's why I have this scar line from ear to ear is like the Terminator pull my skull down, to pull my face down. I was going to say face off. To, but... to, yeah, to, to reconstruct my forehead. with So I have a, a titanium wire mesh from ear to ear. My whole nose is made out of metal. It's They had to take out every single bone because there's it was so cracked. And so it's called a comminuted fracture. It's like a cookie, like a cracker crumbling. There's uh-huh. no way to piece that together. Yeah. So they had to just take it all out and reconstruct my nose with titanium. Uh, I had titanium in my cheeks. I have titanium uh, in my upper palate. Um, I have a big ass piece of titanium from here to here because my jaw was broken. In three me. places. Yeah. Right. Uh, they did all that and it was about a 24 hour surgery with eight different specialists. And then it was recovery. And the whole time I had this, uh, this uh, morphine drip. So I never felt pain. Well, I was, <laughs> whew, I, was I was on cloud nine the whole time. You're like you the know? $6 million man. Oh, uh, for real. Oh, well, they said it's between 15 and 20 Gs of titanium in my face. So I finally recovered. I was able to walk and, you know, and this and that. I had, I had a feeding tube. Uh, remember, I still couldn't talk. I had this goddamn tracheotomy for about two months. If you've never had a tracheotomy, it's a piece of plastic. I haven't. (laughs) In your throat. You can't talk because your voice box is there. Yeah. So you can't talk. It's it's a, right? It impedes your speech. It impedes your speech. Um, I wasn't, my mouth had to remain wired shut so that all the, my teeth could could, could readjust to the, the, you know, they had all been knocked loose. 
So I had to feed, I was fed through a feeding tube in my stomach. So you couldn't even eat for three months. I couldn't even eat. Yeah, I was fed with an insure through, <laughs> you know. Um, I lost a lot of weight, like a ton of weight. I got out of the hospital weighing like 135 pounds. Damn. I was like, yeah, I lost a lot of weight, but I survived. Mm -hmm. So anyways, I finally get out, I go home, and the next day... I feel like this huge pain in my back and they had focused so much on my face and I was so pumped with drugs and like that I never felt any pain come to realize that I had a fractured vertebrae because we went to the VA, the Loma Linda VA the following day and they did an x-ray and they're like, uh, yeah, you got a fractured vertebrae, homie. <laughs> like, what the, Completely no wonder. forgot about it, yeah. Yeah, no wonder I'm the... in pain. Yeah, uh, okay. exactly, exactly. <clears throat> so they were able to fuse that together. Uh, I was one of their youngest patients who had that? a bone infusion in my back. Is usually for people with osteoporosis. Yeah. Right? Uh, so I survived all that. And then more than anything else, it was the survivor's guilt uh, that I had to deal with. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you're a hard-ass Marine. You don't deal with that pussy ass shit feelings. Mm -hmm. The fuck is that? What is that? You know? So uh that's that was something that took about ten years for me to get over. So did um before those ten years, how were you coping with it? Or were you school? Like, I decided distraction? I decided to, to distract myself with going to school and doing the most. So I overloaded every single semester. I was on the dean's list. I just wanted to, I wanted to honor this gentleman's life by doing, being a productive member of society. And I always felt like his death should not be in vain. I always felt guilty for surviving. I was a driver. I always felt like I should have been the one who died, not him. He had a family. He was married. He had kids. He had been in the Marine Corps for 12 years already. Now, this was a guy who, who, who had a career. I was like, I should have been the one. But was it, it only one casualty? Only one for that night, okay. yeah. Um, so dealing with the survivor's guilt was probably the biggest thing that I had to overcome. And the way I tried to do it was just to bury it. And when I got out of the Marine Corps, I was like, fuck the Marine Corps. Fuck that. I never want to do be a socialist. I want to do nothing with it. I don't want to be a part of a veterans group. I, like, I'm one of the few guys who didn't get a Marine Corps tattoo. You know, I was, I was done with that and I never wanted to put my life at risk ever again. And so that's why I, like, I just focused on school and I wanted to go to medical school. And with, I, yeah. within those 10 years, mm -hmm. um, I met this woman. Okay. <laughs> She's a saving grace. Mm -hmm. She was. Um, did you experience any PTSD? Like, let's say like, you know, in, on I any would level. say no. But I have been diagnosed with PTSD. Mm -hmm. I, but I don't. I don't. Uh, I would. I would say no. Like I hear uh, gunshots, and it's probably <laughs> just because I grew up with that shit, living in the hood. Right. That it's like a normal thing to hear gunshots and to to be in those situations where uh, it's. <laughs> Like being surrounded by violence is, is 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 an everyday thing. You were acclimated before you even went in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I was numb to it. Okay, you know. So no PTSD after getting out no. that you that you that can, that I like personally. You personally, feel like you I don't through. feel like I have it. I know I've been diagnosed with it, mm -hmm. but you know, um, the one thing that I do know is like having a. I had a brain injury. And during that period of time, like those were those were new things, explosions and uh, IEDs like that's that was a new way of fighting. And so the military wasn't used to dealing with those sort of trauma. Uh, and so, you know, brain injuries, that wasn't a thing that the military was focused on trying to help you sort through or like treat because it was mostly shrapnel and gunshots and things of that nature. Right. But surviving explosions, <laughs> that whether it's something that was exploded right in front of you. You know, we had survived like four explosions before that actual one that got me. 
uh, shit would blow up. Like, literally, I saw a fucking explosion right in front of me. Like, literally five meters in front of me. If that shit would have been Close on me, we would have been fucked up, right? Um, you're, like, you're such a, like, you're in, I don't know, you're in survival mode. You know, when you're over there, you're survival. And the only way to get like live through the next day is by joking. And well, I've heard a lot of um, people who are in the military. You have a dark sense of humor. Oh, yeah. Right? And it's because of the situation that you're in. And yeah, it's, it's one a of fucked the up only, situation. It's the only way that you can kind of cope it's with the it. the only way you can right? cope, dude. Um, yeah. So what's it like or what, if you can remember, was it like from like, I think a lot of people in Vietnam, and you see it in movies, you see it in shows, mm -hmm. um, even in True Detective, um, season three. <laughs> <coughs> shout out. Shout out. Season three. <laughs> Marshall <laughs> Ali. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the guys who, who's a suspect, he was in like Vietnam, okay. and then um, so was one of the detectives. Okay. And he asked him, he's just like, do you ever miss when your only worry was surviving? Like instead of all the like the everyday life oh, yeah, and everything bro, like that, like, so it's like know. all you had to worry about was making it through that fucking day. Mm -hmm. Like that was your only problem. He's mm -hmm. just like, you ever miss mm -hmm. that? Was it was it something? I, I mean, look, it's it's a weird thing because what made it, I'm gonna say, joyful was being with my friends, um, getting into into some shit with them. Like it's a, it's like a fucking club, dude. It's like it's a fraternity. It's a thing that, it's the rest of the world is doesn't exist, right? Like we're there to to survive. I mean, you're literally just there to to see if you can make it the next day. Because every time we left the wire, every time we left the fucking base, <laughs> we never knew if we were gonna come back, right? Uh, people would get fucked up. The, f <laughs> the, one of the first, when we first got there, one of the first, it wasn't our platoon, but it was one of the platoons that we, we were closely aligned with. Literally the first time they got out, they came back with eight casualties. They got uh... fucked up. And <laughs> we're like, <clears throat> all right. Your patrol, your squad is up for patrol in uh, 12 hours, so get ready. <laughs> it's like, uh, fuck, okay, a, fuck, what, what, what are you going to do, you know? I've never um, experienced it because I, again, I haven't been, I don't yeah. even play Call of Duty. So, um, <laughs> but it's a, I've been told it's like a bond that unless you've, let's say, um, were able to partake in it, mm -hmm. no one would ever understand. Oh, no one, no. Like, no. Right? No. It could be, I've known you since we grew up in Long Beach together, and then <laughs> I moved with you to Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be the same. Oh, no, it's never the same. As the guy that you might have known for six months over there, mm -hmm. because you're relying on him, and he's relying on you to stay mm -hmm. alive. Exactly. And that's just something that's not going to compare to a friendship, no matter how long, like, family. Exactly. It's just like, no. Yeah, like, that's why, like, I just told you, I was sure, like, I have... Uh, my my squad that we we go back 20 years and we fucking text each other every once in a while we're in a group chat like these are guys i'm the only one who lives in california everyone is from different states um these are dudes that i will fucking die for yeah. like there's no doubt like if they ever needed me to anything like i got their back yeah and they got mine and we pick up right where we left off which is making fun of each other and fucking <laughs> <laughs> treating each other like shit. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and bragging on each other. <laughs> it's such a toxic masculinity <laughs> way of bonding, it's, but that's how like, we do it. I was going to say, it's, it's a way of bonding, though. It, it is. Or coping. Uh, or coping. Right? Yeah, 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 coping. You know, it's unfortunate because a lot of my friends, and I'm just speaking in general, like, I made it a point to, to make sure that my time in the military wasn't going to be the best time of my life. Mm-hmm. And for a lot of guys, it's the opposite. For a lot of guys, that is the best time. And that there's nothing that will ever compare. And it's true, though. It will. There's nothing that ever compares to that experience. But I was always very keen on making sure that it wasn't going to be the best part of my life. Because I'm not a career military. If I was a career military, maybe that would, uh, that would make sense. Yeah. That your career is the best. Yeah, sure. But if you're in it just for the four years and you're in and out, Bro, like you have the rest of your life to live 
And there's so many veterans that come out and it's just like they always feel like that was the best thing that they ever did in their life. And it 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 kind of hobbles you, like it stunts you. It, it's like it's unfortunate. Do you feel um, like it was um, a sense of purpose while you were in the Marines? Or because again, you, you, you have so kind of like what you're saying right now, where like a lot of people make that their their well, glory my days. experience was very different because I will say this: the the guy, a lot of I would well, I can't generalize, but I know for a fact that me joining the Marine Corps was the first thing, the first thing that I wanted to do. It was, it's not like it was an option for me. Like this was a choice, and I wanted to do this. I wanted it. I wanted to use this experience as a launching board. So many things that you want to do. For a lot of my friends, this was the last thing that they could do to make something decent out of their life. Like then, literally the last option they had. And then that, I think, kind of ties into my question. When people, where it's like the last thing or the final thing, and then you don't do that thing anymore, you lose your sense of purpose. Yeah, but yeah. it wasn't like that for you. No, it wasn't like that. Because to you, it's like a springboard. Right. So let me do this for a little bit. Again, let me be independent. Let me experience right. your reasons for being in the Marine Corps. Exactly. Um. And then when you got out, you... Uh, mind you, I never <laughs> thought that I was going to go to war, let alone also, get fucked correct. up. Right. That, I mean, even when you're there and you're training and you're in combat, you still feel invincible. Because, bro, like, we're out there. We got 300 rounds of ammunition on us. We have our M16s. We have our body armor. We have our machine gun. We feel indestructible. Bro, that... <laughs> you know? I would feel invincible. Me, you are. me. I would no, not invincible. I'd feel invincible. I'd be like, damn, I'm gonna get fucking shot. <laughs> no, fuck that, dude. I'd be like, because we I got don't... my squad and my boys. We got our fucking good, like, you know. Yeah. We, we're gonna out train you, out yeah. fight. We're gonna out hustle you. We're gonna out fucking heart you. Damn, that you know? that's a uh, again the the the, the, the mentality, the warrior mentality, is state of so mind, crazy, the frame. Bro. Yeah, like you're, the, um, you know, I was ready to kill. Uh -huh. And I was ready to die. Uh huh. It, just that simple. You know how close I've been to that? Skydiving. <laughs> I told the guy, and I was just like, I'm prepared to die. So you can do all you know. <laughs> <tricks> you want. <laughs> I've never been in a situation where I've had to kill, but uh -huh. there's only been one situation where I'm like, yeah, motherfucker, I know I might die. Right? Oh. So if you think that you're going to trick me by saying we're going to go on three and we go on two, <laughs> that's out of the bag, big bag. I already know. That's the only thing that I can be like, yeah, I'm prepared to die. <laughs> yeah but again you you have that prepared to die every day when you're there right you you have that conscious uh mm -hmm. again frame of mind mm -hmm. that 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 is a possibility it is a, and yeah. it's just like yeah not not today right 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 just like, you, I, don't, I got, you don't know like my boys we're gonna we're gonna joke around mm -hmm. fuck around until some shit happens right and uh, then our base got attacked by the way like even I, I was saying, like we would we would go out and never know if we we're gonna come back. Even when we came back, our shit got attacked with mortars and like literally a fucking explode a mortar uh, round landed maybe like like in the parking lot. Let's say this is <laughs> and okay, you're there like, <clears throat> all right, cool. Well, that didn't land on me, so I'm good. So this is wild <laughs> to me because I don't know I don't know what are they called rules of engagement, uh -huh. right? I don't know what this is all about, but when I'm playing tag, base is safe. <laughs> <laughs> you can't fucking tag me. Do they not know that? No, they don't play with those rules. They don't, they don't, they don't follow the rules of engagement. Uh, yeah. well, why do we have the Treaty of Versailles? <laughs> right? yeah. No, it's funny because um, that was a big thing. Our, our, the, the overall mission over there was to win the hearts and minds of the Iraqis. And you can't win the hearts and minds by shooting everything that walks. You can't do that. Yeah. So the rules of engagement for us was you cannot shoot until you're shot at yeah. first. But what if they're holding their weapons? They have to shoot you. They have to shoot at you. <laughs> Dude, that's like, bitch. Mm. All right. It's just like, yeah. If you get punched, then you can punch back. Right. Yeah. And so uh, it's such a, like, it's such a different way of life it's it's it, it's it, there's no like that 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 lifestyle that reality you can't bring that to the civilian world and expect to assimilate you can't 
you end up mm-hmm. growing out your beard and your hair. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Turning into exactly. a hippie. And exactly. And once you got out and once you were you like, all right, like now this is what I'm gonna do with my life. I'm gonna study and you were studying medicine, right? I was studying medicine, yeah. I wanted to go bar? Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Kinda. Because I was kinda in a weird situation i was like well i don't I de- like a lot of my friends joined did things to put their lives back at risk first responders firefighters paramedics fucking cops a ton of my friends are cops eh, you know <laughs> I-, I get it uh-huh. uh but i was never gonna do that i was like i already got fucked up I was, uh, i'm not gonna do this Why increase shit. the probability right why do that and I, I was like, I never believed in this war to begin with. I'm going to get popped, as a cop, be popped by some fucking crackhead for no fucking, like, damn, that's such yeah. a, no, I'm not going to do that. So. And you wanted to do medicine to help people? I wanted to do medicine because I was like, these motherfuckers saved my life. I That's the least that I can do. Try to save try somebody to save else. someone else's life. And mm-hmm. you were on the dean's list and you just buried yourself in books. Yep. Right? And then you said that it was, um. You didn't deal with the survivor's guilt until 10 years later. How did you deal with that? Um, I was finally able to call the surviving spouse of the guy who passed. Mm-hmm. I'm like, you just I, I, I was, I, I saw her contact on Facebook and I finally had the courage to to communicate with her and call her and talk to her. Was it always like uh, something in the back of your mind? Oh, yeah. yeah. That always ate at me. Mm-hmm. And then one day you... I finally had the courage. Decision. I finally felt like I had done enough <laughs> in my personal life to let her know that his death wasn't in vain. So within that time frame, maybe you were holding off on it because it was like, I need to make something of myself mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. before I reach out to know that it wasn't in vain. Exactly. And then yeah. you reached out? And then I reached out. Phone call? A uh, phone call. Yeah, we, we messaged on Facebook, and then she gave me her number, and then... Do you remember what then, your Albany message was? I don't, but I do remember being able to tell her that, you know, um, that I made something out of my life for him. And uh, she was very happy to hear from me. Hmm. Uh, she was very humbled by it all. Uh, we cried. We both cried. I'm about to cry right I mean, now. like, I never even knew the guy. That's the thing. Like, he was a sergeant with the, her staff sergeant with the snipers. He was in charge of the sniper platoon. And he wasn't even a part of your crew. He wasn't even part of our, he's part of our. General. Of crew. our uh, battalion. Uh, but he wasn't part of our, our platoon, right? He's part of our company, part of weapons company, uh-huh. right? He's a sniper platoon. Um. But I still felt eternally indebted to him yeah. and to his family, you know. And so uh, having the courage to be able to do that, it took a long time for me, you know. Um, and she was very grateful. She was, uh, she, you know, this whole time, but the, the difficult thing, and, uh, you know, you're just a dumb grunt. Uh, you, I felt that it was my fault. I felt that. For what I was the driver, and that I, I should have done something, maneuvered around something. Right. Uh, but I always felt that it was my fault. Obviously, I had to accept, and it took a while for me to accept. Like, no, it's not my fucking fault. Like, yeah. this is war. You know. Yeah. This is shit that happens. You know, you can't control those things. Um. Uh, but. That it just it's 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 a it's it's difficult to get to 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 do that on your own, and you know we're Marines, so going to a therapist and talking to a therapist about your feelings, like that's some pussy ass shit, right? That's mm-hmm. what you're taught. Like you don't do that. You're a fucking man. Like. You're a grunt, like you're a marine. You're a badass, like mm-hmm. you don't have no fucking feelings like that. You're a warrior. You're a machine. You're killing <laughs> and machines. It's like, yeah, but that's cool while you're in there, but not even. But now that you're out in the civilian world, you know, you can't. That's, that's Were not... you able to get, or did you ever seek professional? Help? I mean, I did. 
but <clears throat> ultimately, like I made peace with myself. And once I was able to make peace with myself, then I felt that I was over it and mm. I accepted it. And it's not something that I live with anymore. Like this, this guilt that, you know, survivor's guilt is a real thing. Mm -hmm. um, and especially like being able to talk to her. Um, and I did so after I finished law school. So like once I finished law school, I was like, okay, I did it, ma'am. Like she never, she never even knew that I was doing this for her husband. Right. You know, um, but I felt I was, you know, and so, yeah, I wanted to, I really wanted to go to medical school, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but then uh, I graduated in 2008 when the market crashed, the dep the first recession that we had with Obama, right? Was Obama mm -hmm. president? In 08? No, I don't think, no, I think that was, was it George Bush? No. no. no George was... Bush was in 2006 to 10, I want to say. Yeah. I believe so. Okay. Well, then it was the recession there, the, the housing crisis, the housing bubble. Mm -hmm. So my whole plan was to get a part-time job to study for the MCAT. That's the, the entrance exam for the, medical school. Right, right. For those of people who don't know. <laughs> and so that's a test that, in my mind, I was like, okay, I really had to study for this because it's like they test physics and chemistry and biochemistry and algebra or calculus and uh and biology like you really got to know your shit right it's, oh, yeah. you can't it's, it's it's a multiple choice but you got to know what, what boxes to mark right yeah yeah and so i was like okay i really gotta study for this so i need i need a part-time job because my parents were in costa rica and i was like yo i'm a i'm a big boy like i don't need who are, you, who are you staying with when you lived over here or after you got um out? so i was one of the few uh responsible marines um to save money <laughs> because um everyone else did not save money we're there we're there to live fast and die young <laughs> you know as you're, like before you said that i'm thinking like the circle jerk song uh -huh. live fast die young. for real yeah um most of my friends got out with debt i was lucky i saved money i got out with thirty five thousand dollars i nice. saved and i used that money to put towards the down payment of a home Okay. Because my whole thing was, I am sick and tired of living with disgusting fucking pigs. <laughs> my roommates, my my buddies, my friends, but they're nasty. Mm -hmm. They're they're guys are gross. <laughs> A lot of guys are, dude. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand it. It's it's so unsat. It's 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 nasty. I just, so I when yeah. I was like, okay, I'm gonna go to college, but I don't want to live in a dorm and have a fucking room. I'm a grown ass man. Yeah. At this point, right, 22 year old man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I don't want no 20 year old roommate. <laughs> right. So I proposed. I was like, if I'm gonna go to college, I want to buy a house and live in my own home and have my own shit and not have to have roommates. Yeah. So I was able to do that. Um, and I had a GI Bill. Mm -hmm. And because of my dad, he was 100% disabled veteran. California um, gives, if you go to a, a university, a UC or a, a Cal State, you get 100, you get, they match the tuition reduction by the percentage of disability of your parents, of your, of like, a, a, right? Mm -hmm. So my dad is 100% disabled. So I get 100% tuition reduction. So I didn't have to pay, and then on top of that, I get housing allowance from the GI Bill, and I get tuition. So I would use that money to pay for the mortgage. Right. I had, I had all this planned out. Right, right, right. I was right. like, cool, cool, cool. I'm gonna be able to do this shit. I, I don't really have to work. Right. Uh, I ended up, di I did end up working. Right. Because I was like, okay, I'm broke as fuck. Like I'm barely <laughs> making ends meet here, not doing the, not yeah. working at all. You're breaking even. I'm You're barely me, yeah. breaking even. But I like, okay, I need to. That's where I met her. Uh, we met uh, at this part-time job that I had. Um, but yeah, so I finished, I graduated, and then I was going to study, but then I never got that part-time job. And so I was like stressing out. I was like, fuck, how am I going to study? Like, I'm not being able to force shit. Like, I stopped paying the house, right? I was just waiting for it to get foreclosed on. And during a whole period of time, you know, it was suggested to me, like, well, why don't you just, instead of becoming... A doctor wants you to go to law school if you still want to help people you can try to take the lsat 
and I had never studied anything about the law. I had that was never even a. I always had this bad image of what attorneys are. You know, the common stereotype, right? Uh, which is something that I fight very strong to to, to, to fight Disproof. against that. To, exactly. <laughs> so the LSAT, uh, I was like, well, I don't even know anything about the law. Like, uh, well, I realized that you don't have to know anything about the law to take the LSAT. And it's not a test that tests anything about the law. And law schools themselves don't require you to have an undergrad in anything law related. They just want you to have an undergrad. Period. It could be in anything. Really? Anything. Most. Not most, but a lot a very popular uh, undergrad to have to go to law school is philosophy. Mm, yeah. Because that's that where sense. you learn how to reason yeah. and learn Democracy. how to. Yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> when, uh, I, I was like, okay, well, what is this test about? It's like, well, it's just reading comprehension, vocabulary, logic, games. Yeah. I was like, oh, I think I can fuck with that. Right. So I took. I prepared, I didn't have to study for it. Like that's what that's what was like, okay, I don't really have to I don't need to know anything specific. I right. just need to have a sharp mind. And so that's where I was like, okay, well fuck it, I'll do it. And so I took the damn test and then I got a pretty fucking good score and I applied to the only like ABA law school. ABA is American Bar Association, by okay. the way. Um that means that if you it's accredited nationwide. So that if you go to law school here, you can, you can be and practice an attorney in any other state. Okay. Right. So Laverne was an ABA law school at that time. And it's a local college because I was broke. Right. I'm not going to go fucking live in L.A. or any other yeah. fucking state. Like, dude, I live in San Bernardino. Like, I still need to afford to go to law school. Yeah. Right. Um, and then I applied to them, and based on the score that I got, they offered me a fucking almost a full ride, a ninety five percent scholarship to go to law school. I was like, "Fuck me! All right, well, I guess I'm gonna be an attorney then." Like, how often does something like that come across anyone, right? right. And so I'm not an idiot, and so I realized, like, "Fuck it, let me just let me let me let me do this shit." Take it and run. Yeah, um, I always put. Like, I was always comparing law school to medical school. I always was like, dude, law, law school is, that's peanuts compared to medical school. Mm -hmm. um, I never went to medical school, but I can tell you <laughs> that law school is a fucking challenge. It is academically some of the most difficult things that I've ever done. Um, you have to have a, a lot of dedication. Um, and determination to to not only finish it but like do decently in it mm -hmm. you have to read a lot like a shit ton yeah and you have to have your reading ability like you have to be able to think quick and um i mean it's 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 a challenge um, there's a high rate of dropout i mean law school is a filtering system right uh, ultimately you want to be an attorney because just because you finish law school doesn't guarantee that you're going to become an attorney. You still have to pass the state bar exam, mm -hmm. right? Which is the ultimate test of your skills as to whether or not you're a smart enough person to help other people, basically, right? right? Like your aptitude. Exactly, right? Because <laughs> they're really testing on your ability to be able to help others. Um, and uh, bro, law school was, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. I like how you put that though. Um, because again, there's a misconception of what lawyers are, mm -hmm. right? And there's stigmas and stereotypes, mm -hmm. but it's a person who understands the law sufficiently or well enough so mm -hmm. that you can help somebody right. who's not well versed in laws exactly. and different things. So yeah. The bar is determining whether that person has the capabilities mm -hmm. and the understanding to be able to help people. Exactly. Exactly. And ultimately, that was the whole thing is like, <sighs> I'm a first generation student, right? Um, I didn't have anyone in my family to like guide me through college. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let alone law school, right? So 
when you're a first gen, you put so much pressure on yourself to to prove to your family and to the others around you that you belong here too. To yourself? Mm-hmm. Mm, not really to myself. I I maybe was, I'm just cocky like that. I knew I belonged there. Mm -hmm. Like this ain't shit. I can do this. But do other people around me know that I can do this? Mm. You know? Okay. Right? Because there's a pride thing. There's uh, what do they call it? Um, pride month. Imposter syndrome. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's this imposter. That's a real thing. It's a real thing. The imposter syndrome is where you feel like you don't belong there. Mm -hmm. No, no. I felt that I belonged there. I scored high enough. I was like, I belong here. Mm -hmm. I just don't want to. I never thought I'd be here. Right? Because a lot of my classmates are class are guys and gals that they've been dying to be lawyers since they were five years old. Like their their whole course of education, their whole you know upbringing was you're gonna I'm gonna go to be a lawyer. I want to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. I want to be you know fighting and arguing and doing all this shit. I like. I mean, I'm gonna be a lawyer, I guess, but I don't know what I'm gonna do as a lawyer. I, I don't know who I'm gonna help or like. Let me just finish this shit first, and then I'll figure it out. Um, that was my path. It's an unconventional path. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, you know, uh, the statistics in California and nationwide for, for first generation, for Latinos, for, you know, Spanish speakers, you know, the, there is a serious lack of representation in this field. Uh, and California and, and across all the 50 states, it's, it's the same. Like uh, California, I would say, is probably the worst just because we have the most Hispanic population in mm -hmm. the country. Uh, we there's only 7% of attorneys in California that are Hispanic. You had mentioned that, yeah. 7% of attorneys in Mark's California are Hispanic. I mean, seven out of 100 people. Right. Well, there's actually about 150,000 active attorneys, mm -hmm. so 7% of that. I mean, if 10% is 15,000, mm -hmm. half of that, mm -hmm. more or less, right? So you're like you're you're at like 7,500. You're one in 7,500. Yeah, and we have a population, a Hispanic population that's almost half of the population because that's like 20 million yeah. people, right? Yeah. So to be one of one of 20 million yeah right like it's a very uh so these are numbers that i realize like okay i have a duty here to to represent to come up like to i have to i feel i have a responsibility to kind of you know do things and to to really show that uh that we belong and that you know it's not a system that should be that we should be alienated from mm -hmm. this is the only justice system that we got besides street justice but that's gonna <laughs> put you in jail yeah right so it's like you know uh, as as an immigrant I'm, i mean i am an immigrant kind of but not really right like i was no born you're an costa, immigrant right <laughs> you're born in costa rica <laughs> i'm born in costa rica it's a definition right uh was brought over here right um then went back and came back and shit like that right but point being is that uh i recognize that you know this is this is the land of opportunity it really is right and for for people like us uh marginalized societies let's say less fortunate you know growing up in in these terrible conditions um to be able to overcome all of that and join this profession where you know I had classmates whose parents were federal judges. They never went through half of this. Like, they were born to be in this yeah. fucking field, you know? And to be able to be sitting right beside them and doing just as well or better, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a sense of accomplishment there. But then after it all, it's like a sense of duty. Like, damn. I, I need to show to people that like yes, this is a this is a viable option, and that we need more representation. Um, there's actually, we were just at a convention or at a uh, 
I was like, oh, a fundraising event for a legal aid society of San Bernardino. And the county of San Bernardino, uh, the, the judges have uh, a program because they need diversity on the bench. There's too many white judges for this county. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they acknowledge that. They literally were like, we need diversity. When they say diversity, those are like key. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we know, yeah, we know yeah. what they're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They know that it's 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 there's too many white people on that. I'm not saying anything, you know, against mm -hmm. it, but that's just the that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. So we need to change that. And uh, I'm not saying I want to be a judge, but um, there's definitely a, a, a lack of diversity in our field. And, and it's just, it's sad, like, and then, you know, there's a lot of uh, stereotypes. And the unfortunate, there's just a lot of stereotypes, especially stereotypes of what a Hispanic attorney is supposed to do or look like in, uh, and, and the type of law that you're supposed to advocate for, right? Everybody in my family was always like, you're going to do immigration, right? I was like, why the fuck am I going to do immigration? You know how many immigration attorneys there are? You don't, I don't, I don't need to be another immigration attorney. Like there's plenty of immigration attorneys. We got other problems, right? Like we all live here. We need to advance and, you know, come up as a society, as a group, as, as a, as a community. How are we going to do that? if we're just focused on staying out of jail like yeah, that's yeah. the least you know like there's more to it than that right so you know our community needs help in business and um in finance and in real estate and so on and so forth right and those are the areas that i feel where i can make the most impact and the most difference is helping our community or marginalized or minority communities like having a resource and and knowing that i'm I'm a part of this group, right? Mm -hmm. um, like, I will say this. Like, once you join the club of attorneys, you are part of the club, bro. Like, like I go to court, you know, it's, that's, that's my shit, you know? I am not intimidated. I, I talk to judges like they're buddies. A lot of the, the people on the bench I know because I worked with before. You know, like it's not something that we need to be scared of. It's something that we can embrace mm -hmm. and use to our benefit, right? Because that's that's the other thing. It's like people always have this. Or a lot of there's a lot of like the laws only help the white and the privilege, and that's not true. It's not. The law is there intended to help you know everyone, mm -hmm. right? And if you don't like the way the laws are, then we can change it, right? Then there's there's advocate for change, right? Right. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I do acknowledge that I have a response. I feel like I have a response. I could easily feel not. And I'm just here to make money and mm -hmm. fuck the rest. And let's let's see how much we can make. Yeah, I could easily feel like that, too. But, you know, I do want to make an impact. and I do want to make a difference. Um, and I do want to help. So when you yeah. uh, finish law school. Yeah. <clears throat> I know that you had mentioned that you were a clerk. Uh -huh. while you were in law school or yeah, at a law firm. yeah at a law firm yeah and how did you develop your own practice how long was it after <laughs> oh, that man. you you were able to yeah so to blossom I, I, I into was, the beautiful uh, flower that you are <laughs> <laughs> it was, so um i never felt like i really had a choice in opening up my own firm because i always saw the power of being an attorney uh, as I was working at a law firm as a student. And um, I'm one of the very few Spanish-speaking attorneys. Regardless of your race or your background, there's just not that many Spanish-speaking attorneys. Because even though we're 7%, like I mentioned, of his attorneys are Hispanic, not everyone <laughs> speaks Spanish. Yeah. Just because you're Hispanic doesn't mean that, especially mm -hmm. if you're raised here. Imagine you didn't go to Costa Rica. You'd Imagine. be a no sabo lawyer. I'd be a no sabo. <laughs> you're a no yeah. sabo lawyer. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't be marketing myself as a Spanish-speaking attorney because mm -hmm. I wouldn't be. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, so you're but, even... There's an even more finite amount of attorneys who also speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. Aside from the one in 7,500. Oh, yeah. How many of them actually speak Spanish? It's less than half. 
Damn. It's less than it's half. Percent. Yeah. Two percent? Is no, I mean it's 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 a very small it's like we're like about thirty five hundred. Super tiny. Right? It's a Damn. super very small amount of people for a Hispanic population of twenty million. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Damn, dude. So the numbers are dismal, right? Yeah. Um but the point is that uh I I I recognized that I needed to to make it oh so I wasn't gonna make a difference, I felt working for the man. Mm. Mm. Part of the system. Part of the system. Um, I learned what I needed to learn from the man to be able to do my own shit. Right. And I always felt that I could, I could provide a better legal service to to my community, to the Hispanic community, than them going to any other provider, a, a non-Hispanic, non-Spanish speaking person. And the truth is, it, it is when a client comes to you and they can speak to you one on one in their native language and without having to have an interpreter in the middle, there's nothing better than being able to communicate your, your real thoughts and mind uh, to, to that person, right? A level of comfortability. Oh, yeah. And trust. Uh, of course, right? And so I can be on the same level as them, right? And um, it's it it really it I've changed people's lives, right? Yeah. Like even from just a consultation, mm -hmm. right? A lot of people walk out of the office like, "Wow, I I'm relieved." Like I'm so and I haven't even done anything. Yeah, I just explained the law to them in Spanish, mm -hmm. right? Like that's a very powerful thing uh, that I acknowledge that I I have like mm -hmm. and, and so. I was like, what's the best way for me to be able to, to reach out and to do it? And it's not working for someone else because they're not interested in that. Right. They're not interested in serving that community. They're not interested in, 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 in that sort of, in that area of law, let's say, or whatever. Right. Um, these are not cash cows that, that are out there. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah, I was like, you know what? If I really want to do my own shit and really want to give back, I have to do my own shit. I best, have to. I have no choice. Best way to serve your community is to do it on your own. Mm -hmm. Without mm -hmm. being, let's say, under the thumb of maybe a, I don't know if you would call it a corporate umbrella, but. I mean, to some degree. But there's a structure, right? There's a structure there. And then, <clears> like, the, there is, in in the law, it, it, it it's like any other business, right? It, ultimately, it is a business. Which. When I first started, I didn't really think of that. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, how, first of all, how the fuck am I going to get experience and how am I going to get clients and how am, uh, how am I going to let myself be known? And the problem is that I'm fucking shy and I've always been shy and I'm still that person. Um, but when I decided to open my own doors, I had to get rid of that. Like I, I had to... Bro, like I, I would be starving. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. shyness is just gonna. It's a uh, <laughs> closed mouth is not get fed. Exactly. Exactly. Right? Um, so I had to figure out a fucking way to get rid of this damn shyness and to to let people know that I exist. Mm -hmm. And so you know, I started networking. I started getting out of my shell, having to you know talk, and then. You know, I just never real like you, you just I, I I dude I I like I don't I'm just an attorney. Like I just happen to fucking pass the bar. I'm not like that special. I, I'm just you know, I managed to get by, I managed to do these things. And so uh I don't it's hard for me to like show that off. Mm. Right? I mean, if you see me look how I'm dressed, like mm. you, this is this is how I go about right? right um it's hard for me to like be cocky about it or to like be feel some sort of like distinction it's like i'm just here trying to hustle just like everyone else right i happen to figure out a way that you know to find myself in a field to do something that i feel i can give back that i can that's honorable that i can you know grow as well and 
you know, do something good on this planet while I'm here. You right. Know? So, um, but I think that's something that you, um, maybe it's not being cocky about it, but it's, it's having the confidence of, yeah, you happen to pass the bar, but how many people don't pass the bar? Oh, no, shit time. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And I passed the California bar. Is that harder? It is the most Hard difficult oh. bar exam across the 50 states. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, you know, maybe some people have a different demeanor as to what it means to being a lawyer, mm -hmm. right? A lot oh, of, for sure. You know, there's some people that have a little bit of more bravado and a little bit more of a... Panache. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of a puffed out chest. Oh, for sure. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, a co attorneys are... Most attorneys that I've known that I've seen, there's some cocky motherfucker, mm -hmm. right? But it comes with the territory. I get it, right? Mm -hmm. I understand it. But you're, you're, um, let's say, your way of being is different, right? And that's probably, yeah. um, let's say, bit. where, again, I'm thinking of someone who needs legal assistance, mm -hmm. right? And say I'm Hispanic and say mm -hmm. I don't speak Spanish, or I'm sorry, English as well mm -hmm. as other people. Mm -hmm. It's like, Am mm -hmm. I going to feel comfortable going to someone who I don't really speak the language with? Right? right. Independent if they're white or if they're right. black or right. it doesn't right. matter. Right. Right. But it's not someone that I can relate to. Right. Right. And then if you're working under that person, it's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Right. But if I know that there is someone who is, let's say, the face or the head of a firm mm -hmm. and it's like, I'm way more open, just like you said, to even accepting a consultation mm -hmm. to where other times... That's not even a possibility for a lot of people. Yeah, it is. It's true. Because again, it's um coming from our our background of coming into this country like as immigrants. And there's a lot of times when you come right. from third world countries right. and then you go into a big glass building. Right. And it's intimidating. And right. it's just like, I'm not even gonna go in there. Mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. I'll just deal with this on my own or yeah. not deal with it yeah. and not seek the help that I deserve. Exactly. Exactly. That I'm entitled to, just as anybody right. else is. Right, right, right. But then right. they come across someone like you, um, and then they have a beacon of hope. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Um, I, I'm not God. I'm not a judge. I'm not the jury. Um, I certainly don't make the final decisions on anything. But um, I encourage people to to use our justice system mm -hmm. and. There is justice uh, at the end of the day, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, but I have learned that like what is fair to you is different than what is fair to someone else, yeah. right? And so, what is considered justice is depends on who you're talking to. Yeah. So, um, it's a it's this is a people business, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, it is it is something that ultimately you use all you can do is use to help it use mm -hmm. use use this this skill this license this business to help other people you know in their lives right, right. and and i i do it's very you know the first time that i made a difference in someone's life i was like i mean that's kind of dope also i was like fuck this person is like depending on me to make a difference in their lives. Oh, yeah. So it's a lot of pressure. Oh yeah. It's a lot of pressure because people expect you to be like perfect. Right. I mean, you're an attorney, you know, you went to law school, you passed the bar, you know, like you have a satchel you're, right? or a briefcase, <laughs> right. You're supposed to be smarter than everyone. You're supposed to know everything yeah and i'm just a human being right like everyone else right i'm still i have 10 years under my belt uh, as an attorney i'm still learning mm -hmm. every day mm -hmm. right so yeah it's a big responsibility but you know it's something that uh i've embraced and we'll see how long this goes <laughs> so, um, i think that's dope though that um you get paid to help people Mm -hmm. right and that's how yeah. i i kind of look at yeah. it which yeah to an extent like my job is similar right i'm not an attorney mm -hmm. but i make a living helping people yeah. yeah right and 
Your when, problems become my problem. Mm-hmm. And the minute that the client feels that, their immediate relief, mm-hmm. which is like, okay, cool. Now, have someone in this fight with me. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. a lot of the times people feel that they don't. Right. Or again, it's um things right. that, again, who knows the judicial system? Right. Right. right? Who it's knows? very intimidating. Yeah. I, I can, I, like, from an outsider perspective looking in, I can understand why people are so hesitant and fearful and like so like there's just like this this heaviness oh, that dude. weighs on every little decision that they make, right? I got to go to court in like a couple of weeks <laughs> for like a, a ticket. And I'm like, damn, man. I know I haven't done anything wrong, but I'm going into the belly of the beast <laughs> again. And it's just, it's I mean, you know, working from the inside of it is like... This is a human system. Mm-hmm. Like there is actual compassion in yep. in our justice system. And if you had an opportunity to talk to judges, judges are very fair. Like there's don't get me wrong, there's judges that are assholes, but they're fair. They are fair. And I I do acknowledge that about like our I don't I don't I'm maybe I'm fortunate to be in this county in this in this region. And I feel that, you know, our judicial officers are really there to make a difference and to be fair and impartial. Um, and that that that's what keeps the system working, you know, at the end of the day. Right. Um, but there is justice, right? And, and it's just getting to it, access to it is where the challenge is for the, mm-hmm. the majority of the people, right? yeah. for a lot of people. And that's where I'm trying to make a difference, right? Where I'm like... Let me show you. It doesn't have to be this expensive. It doesn't have to be, you know, yeah. something that is going to cost you an arm and a leg. You have right? a, a reoccurring, uh, I would say, theme in your life, mm. right? You're the pathway to possible justice. Mm-hmm. You're like the IHP. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's like justice is over here. Uh-huh. This is your uh-huh. client. And I'm yeah. the person that's going to hopefully get you here. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's the same thing when you're in law school. I'm you're a bad driver. <laughs> <laughs> but there's there's situations where, again, like when you're in school in Costa Rica, like, you know, the kid next to you is the president's kid, mm-hmm. right? And then when you're in law school, it's like the judge's kid, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And then being able to uh, strive and overcome certain things that you may not have been used to or things that you weren't maybe even intending on doing. Right. Right? Yeah, you yeah. weren't intending on doing any of the things that you've done. Like I still don't know where this path is leading me, mm-hmm. right? Because I tell her all the time, dude, I don't really like being an attorney for the rest of my life. Ugh. <laughs> like um, I want to vomit. <laughs> so it's something that you, again, I'm, I've, and just from knowing you and the conversations that we had, it does seem like it is a passion of yours, right? Mm. Um, but at the same time, it may not be something that you want to do forever. <laughs> right? right, right, right. I mean... I probably will remain licensed until right. my end days. But as far as like at actively practicing. Is there anything else an att- that kind of, do you want to be a candle maker <laughs> or uh, <laughs> anything else that you're like, I, I'd like to try that. I'd like to do well, that. Take a crack at that. You know, I don't know. It's, it's, it's nothing that is like. Sticks out. Stands out. You know, I want to be a truck driver. Sometimes mm-hmm. I want to be on the open road. Mm-hmm. I want to I want a restaurant. You know, be in the kitchen and making burritos. Yeah, um, opening up I, another I wanna, <laughs> rotisserie chicken. <laughs> yeah, I do rotisserie chicken. I want to. I'm a handyman. Oh yeah, yeah. Like working uh, with hands. I work with my hands. I, I like I when I owned a home, I did all the home improvement to it. Um, I like working with my hands. I love being in the yard, digging trenches, doing shit in the backyard. Um, there's so many more things that I'd rather be doing than sitting in an office behind a computer. But that's where I'm at right now, and I'm okay with that. Right. Know? And and I and um I not only I'm okay with it, but I I figured out a way to make this like not like fun. Mm-hmm. for me and where i you know I, I understand the mission you know and you know i've built a pretty i built a business behind it and so now i have a responsibility to my employees mm-hmm. right i can't just fucking pick up one day yeah. and be like yeah deuces and yeah. everybody be asked out you know um so you know i have a daughter 
right? I have responsibility towards her. So, um, you know, there's the, I can't just quit just right now. Yeah. Right. So, you know, there's there's whatever will come will come. Uh, but in the meantime, yeah, I'm going to be an attorney. I'm going to be dedicated to this and I'm going to make the most out of it. That's dope, man. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, the way that you came to this point in your life, it, <clears throat> I think a lot of times people when they're young or even when they're not so young, they have a, they struggle with what they want to do and, and what they want to be. Right. Yeah. 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 And it's like some people, since they're little sure. kids want to be a lawyer, right? Mm -hmm. There's some people that they've always known what they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And then there's other people, I think like you and I, who just kind of fall into it. Mm -hmm. And then you end up falling into it and liking it and be yeah. like, Oh damn, I'm kind of good at this. Yeah. Like, Oh, I enjoy this. Yeah. Or yeah. like, again, there's, well, I was just telling, I was just telling her that after 10 years, I finally am enjoying being an attorney. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm enjoying it mostly because I kind of know what I'm doing now. Yeah, yeah. You kind of got the, <laughs> the got, swing got of the things. Hang of it. I got the hang of it. Um, don't get me wrong. The stress, uh, but that's like, kind of. how can I say this? It's like, I'm so used to like being in Iraq, being in a combat zone. You're so, you live with that, that stress every day yeah. that you're going to get killed and shot at. So being an attorney, I live with the stress of I'm handling people's problems. Yeah. And that's just like, like I know how to handle these problems. Right. But it's something that like I just live with because most people don't want to live that life. Most people don't want to wake up knowing that they have 200 clients that are all have fucking problems that you got to fix yeah, or try to fix, you know? <laughs> so, it's uh, learning to live or learning to love the chaos, mm -hmm. manage it. Was yeah. that, I mean, otherwise, sometimes it could be boring. Yeah, I, I do think about that too. I'd be like, I'm such a busy body that if I didn't have this career, this job, I, I'm I'm sure that I would figure out a way to complicate my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, well, what kind of mischief do I need to create so that I have stuff to do? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, man. And um, does he ever yell, I object, when you guys are at home or anything like that? Does he what? Yeah, I object. <laughs> Objection. Objection? No, that would be me. <laughs> right? It's like a uh, permission to uh, approach the bar or the bench. <laughs> and uh, I'm so, at home, I am, I guess I'm kind of the same everywhere I go. Like, I don't want to be in charge mm. of anything. Responsibility? But I am in charge of everything. I don't want to be. <laughs> mm. I think I'm a little like that too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I don't know, say like a group project. I'm like, I'll stay in the back, right? Like, let people have like that responsibility and try to do it. But then it's just like, you guys fucking suck. <laughs> oh, for real. Yeah. yeah for right. real. And this is like, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's <clears> true. It's true. It's funny. Um, I've gone back to playing soccer like a few times okay right and like play indoor or whatever and yeah. i'm always just like yo like i'm on your guys's team right uh -huh. like this you guys do the subs and like everything like that i'm just here to like play yeah. it. where where do you go because let me know I, it's been a minute dude the um, one over here yeah i played at the one right here by like rochester and yeah. there's like a big league dreams okay and it's like every like few years that i'll do that okay, okay. Um, but i was like playing in redlands um with like one of my buddies it was like co-ed uh -huh. and then after a while i'm just, just like fucking move like you out you in uh -huh. like uh, push you this push. <laughs> yeah and it's like mm, again i don't want to assume that role right, right and i don't right, and, right. and i it don't comes natural, yeah and i don't want to do that mm -hmm. it's just like yo your guys this team but then after a while mm -hmm. it's just like no what are, why are you gonna kick the ball you suck you can't get like right out right, right, in right, right. out <laughs> so it's like that uh not wanting responsibility but taking responsibility mm -hmm. is uh something that I th happens to me yeah sometimes yeah. It's, like, it's all right uh, it's it's uh, you know we mm -hmm. make these decisions in life yeah man <laughs> I mean, that's, uh, I think it's part of the personality. Mm -hmm. right? so like, oh, I'll stay I'm still figuring it out, dude. Yeah, man. Still figuring it out. We all are. <laughs> little by little, day by day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. Well, oh, good shit. Yeah, man. We're like at uh, two and a half hours. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah two twenty six. Good, good content. Absolutely, man. It was uh, Have fun good. chopping this up. <laughs> it's uh, usually. Oh, you only had a two hour time slot. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> usually, um, again, my. My brother's done a whole lot more podcasts, so he's easier at like uploading everything and like 
I'm not like technological, like technologically savvy, right? Okay. He is. He was helping me upload one like from like the other day. Okay. okay. Um, I think she was on the computer while I've been sitting here. Oh, he like he shares he shares the screen yeah. from a different computer. Oh, he's really yeah, because yeah, he's remote. like doing stuff is moving, and I'm like, oh, this <laughs> that, dude is. That's loan stuff, though. That's for yeah, like that, the, like the that's loans. Oh, yeah. that's funny. Um, but like sometimes, like <laughs> when I'm editing these, and I'm like, all right, I gotta like do this or mm -hmm. do that. But like, mm -hmm. I think this one will just get uploaded and just posted. Just put the in <laughs> the, the intro on there. And then all right, all the way through, man. I uh, appreciate your time coming yeah, in and sharing your story. Sure. It was um, really, I, I like to hear about people's backgrounds, man. And I like to hear their experiences yeah. and kind of get a I like to things. share my story because it, it's, it's, it's unconventional. It's unique. It's, I've gone through so much shit in my life, bro. Imagine, <laughs> and our, uh, obviously our demographic is a little bit, people around our age or whatever, right? But mm -hmm. Immigrant kid, moved back to Costa Rica, mm -hmm. went to the war, mm -hmm. and then became a lawyer. Like that's yeah, it's I, was a, her, I was talking about. I used to help my mom clean houses on the weekends mm -hmm. because that's what she did. Yeah, you know, uh, I would we would I would I, I always remember, dude. We would go to the park in our neighborhood in Inglewood. We'd get to play. And then we'd have to get a bag and go through the trash cans and collect all the cans and the plastics. To make it. But to make it, yeah. you know. Survive. Yeah. It was so embarrassing for me. I hated that shit. Yeah. I hated that shit. But, you know, I had no choice. I mean, but that, I think, kind of instilled work ethic in you. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Because good student... Um, better student when you were doing the dean's list and when you mm -hmm. got out yes and then applying yourself to again the caliber no yeah no well, the marine corps was instrumental in, in instilling some discipline mm -hmm. but then again you passed a california bar right I did. <laughs> I did. Yeah. Or maybe that had something to do with it that work ethic helping your yeah, mom no, out. yeah i can't let i can't let my family down yeah or myself more yeah. than anything mm -hmm. you know uh, yeah. plus i was like I am not going to let this system defeat me. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know? It's, and, um, uh, it's like, what, there's certain things where it's like, there's nothing you can do about it, but then at the same time, it's just like, but well, what can I do about it? Mm -hmm. And then you just have to find what that what is, and you just got to do it. Mm -hmm. And then some people have limited opportunities. Some people have more opportunities. Um, but it all depends on your frame of mind and how mm -hmm. you look at things. Mm -hmm. And then you can become a lawyer. I mean, you can yeah. become hey bro if you're willing to put in the time you can do it you know you just gotta have that discipline you do have to be a little smart yeah, yeah. yeah. some yeah. people yeah. i mean let's let's uh oh, <laughs> i'm not gonna shortcut that <laughs> yeah let's be honest <laughs> not everyone can do anything Correct. <laughs> I don't know this why people like, say that. It's yeah. not. No, no, no. Not, people not. that have failed the bar exam 18 times. Yeah. It's just yeah. like, hey, maybe you should try something else. <laughs> true, true. I'm not going to discourage you, though. It's, you got to try it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but that's one of the like, things. That's where, you, like, failing is where you get to learn about yourself. I was just watching right? uh, the documentary um, of Giannis uh, Antetokounmpo. Uh -huh. He's just like, failure is a part of success. It's yeah, steps to success. True. Very true. Right? Very He's true. just like, it's not a yeah. failure. It's steps to success. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have to learn how to fail. Mm -hmm. Right? You have mm -hmm. to learn how to fall. And mm -hmm. then the next time you fall, you can tumble. You can, yeah. you know, you can do uh, mm -hmm. something that's a little bit different. Right, right, right. right. Um, you can roll into it and something. do a somersault and yeah. bounce out. <laughs> failure is a part of the process. And it's a part of being yeah, successful. It's true. It's true. And... Um, Actually, one of my buddies, I remember talking to him, and actually, you might know him, Emerson. Um, no. No. Yeah. Um, but I remember he and I were talking one time, and he said, I think once you get over the fear of failure, yeah, you got to get over the fear of success. And I was like, oh, shit. Because mm -hmm. of that imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And maybe thinking like you don't belong, or it was a fluke, or, but it's stay the course and believe in what you're doing and believe in yourself mm -hmm. and you know that there's a purpose and again you had some outside motivating factors yeah yeah for sure right? you had some internal factors because mm -hmm. you didn't want to let not only let your family down right. but you didn't want to let yourself down right right, right. right. And so it's like no i belong here 
Mm-hmm. Like, I just got to make sure I. Give yeah, it no, up. don't get me wrong. Like, if I didn't have my <laughs> my experience of what I went through, the trauma, <laughs> surviving that, I probably wouldn't be an attorney. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what the fuck I'd be doing. No, I wouldn't be doing credit if I wasn't, let's say, having to need to leave Wells Fargo. <laughs> there you I go. was just like, yeah. it was the again like the springboard that put me in the position mm-hmm. to where it started where I'm at now. Yeah. Right. And sometimes it's like, oh, it's um, depending on how you look at it, it could be a negative experience or it could be you know a traumatic experience, right. you know, like the one that you had. Mm-hmm. Um, but those are the things that kind of propel us to where we are now. Mm-hmm. Right. And there's so much more to live. We're so young. Dude, it's so young. I, th- I tell people this and I'm like, I'm not young. I'm not a kid, right? I'm not 18. I'm not 20. Yeah. I'm fucking definitely not old. No. no. Right? It's like, I got a lot of life to live. Mm-hmm. And you can reinvent yourself. And again, you've been doing this for 10 years. And let's say you do it for another 10. And then you still got another 20 that you can make candles. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever it is that we're, true, true, you know, yeah, that we're going to yeah. fall into at that time. <laughs> um, but yeah, Good man, it's, shit, man. It was really fun. Thank you. I enjoyed the conversation, man. Thank you for Appreciate coming on. Appreciate your time. Absolutely, man. <laughs> Tell, uh, we'll put it on here. Uh, you have like the uh, Instagram or like the name of the law firm or anything that oh, you yeah, want to share? Oh, yeah, yeah. So the name of the law firm is uh, mm-hmm. Defiant Law. Mm-hmm. Um, located in? Located in Rancho Cucamonga, California. That's right. <laughs> right across the street? Right, right across the street from yeah. where you're at. And is uh, there, because I, I mean, I kind of know, but what, what mm-hmm. kind of um, law is it that you specialize in? So, I do a lot of, um, my ideal client is a small business owner. So, what type of laws do they need to advocate for them? You're looking at uh, business law, so like corporations and partnerships and um, joint ventures and things like creating agreements for them. Uh, You're looking at labor laws. For the employer to ensure that they're in compliance, right? Mm-hmm. Or if they get sued by an, a former employee to learn how to learn from that, mitigate the damage, and hopefully don't repeat it, right? And Inst- still or have processes and procedures to be in compliance again. Um, you're dealing with contracts, contract negotiation. You're dealing with leases lease negotiation you're dealing with real estate a lot of businesses do real estate um you're dealing with estate planning because you're trying to build the legacy for who for what mm-hmm. right and then you're also dealing with divorces because you know people get divorced sometimes yep. right <laughs> um, yes. so i'm not stranger to that <laughs> um so those are the main areas of law that I that I focus on. Um, another big area of law that that I'm doing is um, I'm helping people who've been scammed through home improvement scams. Mm. Um, a lot of a lot of people have been defrauded through home improvement, solar programs, solar panel upgrades, and things of that nature, where um, they prey on a certain population that's easily preyed upon. Mm -hmm. Uh, easily influenced and unfortunately they don't deliver the goods as promised so there's there's that as well um i kind of like to be a general practitioner Mm -hmm. know a little bit about everything Mm -hmm. do good and all um most of the my clients again are are people right people that there's people behind businesses right at the end of the day this all this whole system is built on people and right. cooperation, right? So, those are the kind of clients and services that I do. Perfect. Yeah. So, this podcast brought to you by Defiant Law. <laughs> if you need a business attorney, a contract attorney, there you go, and a real estate attorney, mm-hmm. visit just Stephon. any attorney. Just if you me, need any attorney, si if usted necesita it, un abogado, yeah, exacto. <laughs> and, yeah, it's 909. Oh, yeah, 909 581 4351. One more time because I interrupted you. Yeah, 909 581 4351. There you go. There you go. Cool, yeah. man. All right, bro. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs>